Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Jonathan Goldman. Jonathan is an international authority and pioneer in the field of sound healing. He is author of numerous books, including The Seven Secrets of Sound Healing and the best-selling The Humming Effect, co-authored with his wife, Andy Goldman, which won the 2018 Gold Visionary Award for Health Books. His classic, Healing Sounds, has just had a special 30th anniversary edition released. Jonathan is director of the Sound Healers Association and president of Spirit Music in Boulder, Colorado. A Grammy nominee, he has created over 25 best-selling award-winning recordings, including Chakra Chants, The Divine Name with Greg Braden, Frequences, Sounds of Healing, and Reiki Chants. Right now, Jonathan is also re-releasing one of his signature online courses, Sacred Vibrational Frequencies. Go to bit.ly forward slash Jonathan Goldman course for full details. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Jonathan Goldman course. If you enjoy today's podcast, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. A big thank you to our sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley, Organifi and our newest sponsors, Ned, Wild Pastures and Peak Life. Their support is essential in producing this podcast and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products they produce. Today, Paul and Jonathan are discussing healing with sound. This episode starts with some healing music from Jonathan, as well as throughout the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our topic is healing with sound with one of my favorite people, educators and sound healers and musicians in the whole world, Jonathan Goldman. It was, it's a great pleasure to have Jonathan here. Jonathan, thank you for joining us today. Paul, what a privilege, blessing, and honor it is to be talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. I've listened to your music for a long time. In fact, I have a whole section right over here of your CDs. And because I do so much writing and deep thinking, you're one of my key sources of mental clarity. (laughs) I I appreciate that. Believe it or not, I've heard from some really well-known artists and writers and whatnot who use my music in their background in order to create. And I just think, what a blessing. Well, I'm an artist as well, and there's many, many paintings. I teach art therapy. I use it in my clinical practice, and I listen to you while I paint as well. Thank you. Uh, This this, this brings us to a a whole different topic that I want to cover later on, which is choices of music for different activities. Yes. There's, There's a whole phenomenon of the relationship between our brain, our nervous system, and the music that we listen to, and not all music works for everyone at the same way. 
Yeah, well, everything you say is true, and I'm sure we're going to get deep into that. I, I, I know that for a fact, and I'm, I'm a collector of music, so I have, I don't know, probably at least a thousand CDs. I like CDs better than the digital format, just because I think the sound quality is more dense, and I have a very high-end stereo, so I can hear the difference very easily. But I have a wide variety of music for creating the and any kind of an experience I want from dance to painting to deep thinking to beautiful music from the Middle East with their interesting sounding flutes and all kinds of stuff. Well, perhaps we can even talk about the medium of playback, whether it's LPs, cassettes, CDs, or basically uh, MP3s and the difference in their vibrational quality later on. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that for sure. I think that's a very important topic. And as I'll share later, Victor Wooten brings that up in his most recent book. And he brings up some really important points and ways of of explaining the differences so we can get into that. What I'd love to hear, and I'm sure the listeners would love to hear, is some, about how you as a person became drawn into the need to express yourself and offer such tremendous amount of amazing music and, and how you develop these skills and how you developed your understanding of music theory, sound theory, and even how you came to the spiritual aspects of it, because I think that's really important because your music isn't just music, it's deeply spiritual music. If you like, I have a story that begins with, I was struck by light one night when I was on stage. That, <laughs> Good. But before that, I want to acknowledge that I've been playing professionally since I was about 15 years old. Went to Boston University, have a degree in filmmaking at, at the time. Had played in some very well-known bands. And I was coming back from a break, strapped on my Stratocaster, began playing music. And I was this was about 1979, and I was in a seaside bar in Marshfield, Massachusetts, that's Cape Cod during the summer, and as I'm looking out at the audience, I become aware that the ambiance in the bar was one of negativity and violence. Mm. Now, no doubt the alcohol and the other intoxicants that people were imbibing in was helping create this ambiance. But I knew also that the music that I was creating at the time was helping amplify this. And I had this simple thought, what if music could be used to make people feel better. And that thought, within the week, it was crazy, shifted about 10 degrees. And it became, what if sound can be used to heal? Which was a whole different topic. And then all of a sudden, I began to, within that time, doors opened up as soon as that occurred. And I was given a uh, sheet of paper with an advertisement for a workshop on healing with sound. Mm. And I went to this workshop, had a life-changing experience. From there, basically things began to go. I founded the Sound Healers Association. I then went into Lesley University and created a master's degree program researching the uses of sound and music. I took my record company and I changed it from being a new wave record company to being a new age record company, but I didn't have to change the title because the record company was called Spirit Music. Good. And uh, from there, I just continued from my master's thesis, my first book, Healing Sounds, came out. And it's just been an extraordinary, joyous, awesome, spectacular, fun-filled ride, being able to not only experience this, but share this with other people. Because as we'll talk about in a moment, if you perceive of sound as being the basic creative force, which I do and a lot of people do, then you realize that everything is vibration and can be and is affected by some aspect of sound. Yeah, that's beautiful. Now, some of the questions I, I wrote up for you, as you saw, get into some of the deeper aspects of sound. My podcast is normally quite deep into these things, and my listeners like that. So I, I thought it would be fun because I know you have looked into this so much, and I know you embody these principles. So my next question is, Numerous creation myths speak of sound as a formative force in the creation of the universe, the world, or life. In the Bible, we have the word, and in Hinduism, we have om, uh, A-U-M underscore, the four part, part section of om, as opposed to just the O-M. Joseph Campbell gives a beautiful breakdown of the actual meanings of om, which I 
feel expresses itself ubiquitously, uh, you know, throughout all of life. Could you share your thoughts on the concept of sound as the creative force of the universe and how you feel source or ohm creates life in general? Paul, great question. And I trust I have an answer befitting the magnitude of the question. <laughs> I think you will. <laughs> but what you shared is true. I could spend the next half hour talking about the creation myths from different traditions and how, how they all encompass some aspect of sound being the initial causative force of life, the universe, and everything. As you said, in the beginning was the word, and the Lord said, let there be light. Sound preceding light. Hindu tradition, in the beginning was Brahman, with whom was the vibration, and the vibration was Brahman. In Papa Vu, in the Mayan tradition, you have the first real men and women giving, being given life solely through the power of the word. In the Hopi tradition, the spider woman sings the song of creation and gives life to all inanimate beings. In the um, ancient Egyptian tradition, the god Thoth would think of an object, speak its name, and bring it into being. In the Far East, the gods and goddesses would hit a gong or blow a conch and bring inanimate matter into life. And what I love about this is, okay, so we have our ancient mystics in agreement about this, but now we have our modern quantum physicists talking about this. They talk about super string theory, for example. Mm -hmm. and how there are just so many different levels, and the vibrations of the string are acting slightly out of tune. And what is so interesting about a string, and we'll talk about this later too, but a string displays harmonic principles, which may be the basis of much that is. So we have this totally uh, unique aspect of uh, life, the universe, and everything coming from sound. It's so interesting because as you're talking about Aum or Om or whatnot, I do a monthly, something called a sound satsang that is free, that is live, that people come to. And the last couple of ones that we've done have been on the power of the mantra. And mm. uh, one of the first things is, you know, talking about Om and just even talking about the pronunciation of Om, because you can have... Literally, when I was first beginning this phenomena back in the early 80s, I read a brilliant book by a guy named, a professor named John Blofeld, who, uh, the book was called Mantra, and he had a chapter on the uh, pronunciation of Om. And according to him, and it just felt so resonant and so correct, depending upon the dialect and the people, Om can be pronounced a whole lot of ways. Now, you will find spiritual masters and gurus who say it must be me pronounce Aum. Others will say it's Aum or whatnot. You can, you can have so many different ways of doing it. And you're totally technically correct, uh, correct that it's actually a three-syllable word in Sanskrit. But, you know, I have a very dear friend who is a Tibetan monk, a very high up Tibetan monk, uh, one of the Dalai Lama's favorite chanting monks. And uh, we've talked about this uh, because uh, one of my favorite mantras is the Tibetan mantra, Om Mani Padme Hom, mm. which is great. But in Tibetan, it's Om Mani Peme Hong, quite mm. different. And so we're saying, okay, you know, Lama Tashi, uh, is it, does it really matter if we pronounce it one way or the other? And no, his big thing was that ultimately it's the intentionality. Uh, they have a different term in, in the... Uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but basically the thoughts, the feelings, the consciousness that is encoded upon the sound that really gives it its juice. Having studied Joseph Campbell's works quite extensively, he speaks at length about Ohm in various books and recordings that I've studied, and he breaks Ohm down. He says, the A, ah, I awaken, ooh, yes. I'm dreaming. Mm, I'm falling asleep, underscore, end of cycle, beginning of something new. And in his teachings, he says that the pronunciation is ah, uh, and then ooh, and then he says you're supposed to eat the M mm, and take it down into you. Now, of course, he's using the lineage that he studied, I think, which was Hinduism. 
to, to give us that meaning. But I just find it interesting, particularly, I, I understand what you're saying about pronunciation because I've heard it pr- pronounced a million ways. Yes. But what I think is most interesting about Ohm that a lot of people don't understand is that the Ohm is actually a creative cycle and it correlates to the four seasons, spring, I awaken or birth, ooh, summer, I'm dreaming, I'm living my life, I'm going through the process of experiencing all of it, mm, fall fruiting phase. I'm now at the later stages of my life and I can look back on it all and see how all the golden threads connect and how it's all so beautiful and meaningful. And then death is the underscore end of cycle. So I think it's amazing that most people don't know the depth of the meaning of of that word. But when you understand it as a creative principle, not only of sound and a creative force, but also something that is showing us the life cycle that all living beings go through, like the process of morphogenesis. It's really quite a powerful statement. I love Joe Campbell. Yeah. The Power of Myth, one of my favorites. And uh, I would know better than to refute anything that's said. Instead, I would like to suggest that, as you said, that is coming from one aspect of one of the traditions in the Hindu tradition. You can, if you like, go talk to many different gurus. I did this when I was doing the uh, sound satsang and mantra, and I went to do what is the correct pronunciation of Om. And in four or five different videos that I watched, they were all different, and they all refuted. It is not Om. It's not Aum. It's not, you know, and I'm going okay. Uh, and I think, <laughs> but the thing is, if you believe it. Yeah. Then it is. And that's the important thing. We have to really honor ourselves. And I'm going to just jump in. I don't even know if Joe Campbell or Joseph Campbell, let us honor him with his full name, was aware that there's something called Pantanjali's Yoga Sutras. Yes, he was aware. He he speaks about it at length. All right. Well, in one of the major translations, and it's been translated by a gazillion gurus, yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite gurus was Swami Sachananda, who was the Woodstock uh-huh. guru. I was at Woodstock, so this guy hooked me in, and he had a half a million or more people chanting at the same time, and this changed my consciousness. But uh, my wife and I were teaching at his ashram, and I walked into the apartment they had for us, and there was a copy of his translation of the Yoga Sutras. I opened it up. And just synchronistically, if you like, I look down and there's Sutra 1.27. And this is Goldman's basically synthesis of uh, what it was written. The original sound of creation was pranava, the humming of prana. They mm. had to give it a name, so they called it Om. Ah. So that's just another event that Om, the hum, was actually the original creative sound. And everything is interrelated, so you can't separate O from M, and you can't separate OM. And in fact, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but there are a lot of physiological benefits when you hum. And a lot of the peer-reviewed research that occurred from that was they didn't have people hum, they had people go OM. So most of the time, it also applies to the OM. The most important thing that you're pointing to isn't if the if there's a specific shall we say formal pronunciation it's the intention that you're tying to the vibration because ultimately that is the vehicle by which consciousness creates is intention i for example when i'm teaching classes at my institute i point out the a very important thing that a lot of people don't understand and that is that the word intention if god is unconditional love or pure potential then it is not until you have an intention that you put pure potential in tension. So the analogy I give is if you want to pull somebody out of the ditch with your car, you have to put the rope in tension before you can pull them out. <laughs> so if God is pure potential, then you your intention takes potential and spiritualizes it. And that is the flow of spirit. So if our intention is not clear, then neither will the reaction to the creation that we're making be clear. So, Paul, uh, I love this because intention is so important 
that I want to sort of drift into something that I recently created, which is called the Four Pillars of Sound Healing. Sure. If we can discuss that, we can bring in intention and how I sort of became aware of it a long time ago. So may we do that? Yeah, of course. Okay, so sound healing. I've been in this field for too long, but sure. <laughs> you know, and I, I have people who say, oh, I've been in this field for, you know, 50, 60 years. I say, yeah, but you're only 45 years old. How can that be? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Or, you know, I came out singing from a mother's womb. Okay. It didn't happen to me. I had this sort of really reawakening. I had all sorts of major uh, cosmic things. And I've always been interested in mysticism and the esoteric ever since I was a little kid. UFOs and telekinesis and whatnot. But it was like around 1979 that I had this real cosmic um, jolt of light. I began to basically research the uh, power of sound to heal and transform. But back then, Paul... There was not too much going on in terms of uh, sound healing. It was mm -hmm. my great honor to bring a small group of people together at the time, and it was, we called it the Sound Healers Association. But there was very little. Nowadays, I'm going to, I mean, 15 years ago, I would be speaking to my wife. I said, you know, sound is really growing. It's going to be where yoga is at. And lo and behold, it is. Yes. And everybody has come out and they're sound healers, which is great. But I said, you know, they're missing some real major focal points. They've latched on to certain things and they're missing a couple of really powerful things that some of them took me 10, 15 years to understand. They're simple, but there are aspects of it. So I'd like to share what these four pillars of sound healing with you are. Okay. And this, they actually, after we um, came up with them, I said, I wonder how they relate to the secrets in my book, The Seven Secrets of Sound Healing, that is from Hay House. And I looked, and by gosh, by golly, they were the first of the seven secrets in order. I said, wow, okay, I think I was onto something. So let, yeah. us be, let us begin, okay? The first one is that everything is in vibration. We talked about this. From the electrons moving around the nucleus of an atom to planets and distant galaxies, everything is creating a vibration. Now, this vibration may or may not be understood as sound because sound, as we know it, falls within a bandwidth of what we call frequency. So frequency is sound travels as a wave. It moves in cycles per second. We hear from around 16 of these cycles a second, the very low end, to around 16,000, 16, which is almost ultrasonic. Uh, but just because we can't hear something doesn't mean that there isn't a sound being created. Our finny friends in the ocean, the dolphins, can make and receive sounds upwards of 180,000 cycles a second. So to us, there is nothing going on, but dolphins may be exchanging roots through the Bering Strait recipes for tuna noodle casserole, or they may be exchanging information with the beings from Cirrus. I don't know. Or maybe I do and I'm not talking. But regardless, just because we can't hear it doesn't mean that there isn't a sound. So with the idea that everything is in a state of vibration, this includes our body. Every organ, every bone, every tissue, every part of our body is in a state of vibration. When we are in a state of healthy resonance, the healthy harmonic or harmonics are encoded upon each organ, bone, tissue, and we say we're in sound health. Mm, we're like yes. this overall orchestra that is playing the symphony of the self. But what happens if the second violin player loses their sheet music? They begin to play out of tune, out of harmony. Pretty soon the entire string section is off. Pretty soon the entire orchestra begins to sound off. And this is a metaphor for if a part of our body has lost its natural harmonic resonance and is vibrating out of tune, out of ease, out of harmony, we are say it is dis-ease. So the very first principle of using sound as a healing modality is to somehow give this string player back their sheet music to somehow restore the correct vibrational resonance to that part of the body mind, spirit, chakras, whatever that is vibrating out of resonance. And I'm going to just also say, this is not only related to sound. This is the basic principle, 
principle of practically every alternative therapy that I know of, whether it's homeopathy, naturopathy, chromotherapy, light, aromatherapy, even chiropractic and acupuncture are based on this principle of restoring balance. Yes. And I know that you know this. Mm. It's, it's true. It's, it's a very important principle. I mean, people tend to think of the body as an object made of a bunch of smaller objects, not realizing that sound is the formative force and that every, every single shape in your body acts like an antenna and changes the flow of vibration, which uh, Ibrahim Karim has shown very clearly through his science of biogeometry. And then you have, of course, sonic geometry showing you how shape and influences sound and vibrations. So there's a lot of beautiful harmonies. Yeah, there is cymatics, and we can maybe talk about that later because I sometimes have some questions about uh, some of this uh, sound geometry stuff, and that's okay because you can have a, a mathematical proof, but it might not be real. But regardless, I mean, I think that fluidity is a major important aspect of being. If we are like a board in a windstorm, we might snap. But if we are fluid and can move back and forth like a shaft of wheat, and I think that may be one of the keys. So actually shifting frequencies in mm -hmm. this extraordinary time rather than being stuck. And this is my frequency and I got to maintain it. Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I suspect you've heard me speak about the Czech Academy on my podcast, and I'd love to extend a very special offer we've created for all of you. We created the Czech Academy so that anyone wanting to master a truly holistic approach to living, rehabilitation, strength and conditioning, athlete development, or holistic lifestyle coaching can gain mastery with the guidance and the support of true masters, the Czech Institute instructors, and mentors. The Czech Academy is ideal for anyone wanting a career change to enhance their professional skills and meet the demands of the public today and is a multidisciplinary program. We have doctors and therapists of many types and encourage cross-pollination because none of us has the full range of expertise to handle all the challenges people commonly present with today. We encourage all Czech professionals to network with other experts and to learn and grow by working together for the betterment of all and particularly the patients and clients. The Czech Academy Open House is an opportunity for anyone interested in the Academy to get a taste of the Academy learning experience. The Open House is free to everyone. The Open House provides seven days of access to the Czech Academy e-learning platform, and participants will be able to take select lessons from our online courses, including Integrated Movement Science Level 1 online and Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 2 online, preview our Academy-exclusive online workshops, Check out our Academy business assets like package templates, client onboarding checklists, and more. Watch group mentor sessions. Hear from current students about how they're applying what they've learned. You will also receive a free Czech career consultation with Gavin Jennings, CEO of the Czech Institute and co-founder of the Czech Academy, so any questions you have can be answered. You can register for the open house right now, but registration for this event ends on September 22nd, so please don't wait to the last minute. To register for the open house, go to C-H-E-K dot group forward slash open dash house. That's check dot group forward slash open dash house. Enjoy your free access to the Czech Academy and feel free to talk to Gavin and get all your questions answered. We'd love to have you. And as you all know, the world needs a lot more holistically skilled, open-minded health and exercise professionals right now. And this is your great opportunity to be the best. Let's go to the second secret of sound healing. It's intent is powerful, which you and I can talk about now, but imagine that it's back in 1982. I have been collecting all these documents, pieces of paper. I have a, uh, basically I have a stack of paper about a foot high. This is when we still used paper. And when I was using a computer, they used a DOS operating system. And I'm basically collecting information for my uh, master's uh, program. And my, Paul, I, my father, grandfather, and brother, all medical doctors. I'm pretty well-developed left brain. I said, ah, I'm going to be the first guy who puts all this stuff together and going to come up with a specific frequency or frequencies for the organs, for the chakras, you name it. Because I had it all there. And I began collecting this information and putting it all together. And all of a sudden, 
I'm in a state of intellectual angst. I'm, I remember sitting back and forth, rocking with my he- head in my hands, because none of the information correlated. You would have spiritual master A using a particular set of uh, mantras for uh, chakras and spiritual master B using very different mantras. You would have Dr. X using a particular set of frequencies for one organ, Dr. Y using a completely different set of frequencies for the same organ. And I said, how can this be? How can this be? And Paul, this was at a time before anybody heard of sound healing in the mainstream. These people were sharing this stuff with me out of love. And hey, I've been doing this and this is what I found. I've been doing this. And it didn't make sense. And I'm a little bit freaked. And all of a sudden, I hear this inner voice. And it says, it is not only the frequency of the sound that makes its effect. It is also the intention of the person making and receiving the sound. And it was like a light went off and I wrote down the words frequency plus intent equals healing. I wrote that in the early 1980s. It is more relevant now than ever. But imagine what it's like when I've had this huge aha and I'm now at these scientific, musical, medical conferences, and I'm talking to these different doctors, I'm saying, hey, have you ever thought of the importance of intentionality? And they looked at me like I was from another planet, which I well may be, Paul, but nevertheless, it was really, (laughs) really difficult. And then, blessed be, you have people like Bruce Lipton writing his biology of belief, or Joe Dispenza doing the placebo effect, or Masuro Emoto doing his work with uh, water. You get Lynn McTaggart doing her intention experiments. You got on and on. And, and it's just, it's so great now to be able to talk about the importance of intentionality because uh, we're now on the same page as, uh, as opposed to this separation between consciousness and reality. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Totally. And I think, you know, one of the challenges, you know, I own an institute and I spent years and years looking into science and research on everything. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is no matter what topic you look into, if you start searching the scientific literature or general literature, you'll always find people with equal qualifications that are diametrically opposed on almost everything, whether it's is cold water showers good for you or is a vegetarian diet good for you? you? You name it. And so, you know, what I tell my students is I quote Steiner and his structure of the soul. And Steiner says in his teachings that this is inherently going to happen. But whenever that happens, it's your soul calling you to investigate for yourself. And he says, only when you ask honest questions and answer them yourself, do you activate what he calls the awareness soul so that you go out of being programmed and into having your own authentic experience and identifying what's true for you as an individual. So I think it's very important. You know, your story makes makes this a, an important point. And, you know, you investigated this for yourself and came to the truth, which now lots of people agree with. But I think it's important for everyone to know whenever you get conflicting advice, you don't just go with the expert that appeases you or is most in line with your dogma, you got to go inside of yourself and really seek to find the answers to the questions. And, you know, for me, when I, when I studied sound healing, which I have for many years, is I've always tested things on myself, whether it be tuning forks or my own voice and, or, you know, I've taken courses on mantra and practice and say, okay, what's being affected in me? Is that, do I feel that in my liver? Do I feel it in my heart? And I think that's the important thing is to engage the experience instead of just trusting somebody else to tell you what's real, or you can have a lot of beliefs that are contradictory to what you really actually need for your own medicine, so to speak. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love it. I like like to say we are our own best laboratory. Amen. And I want to say that this brings us to the third secret of sound healing, the, the third pillar, if you like, of sound healing, which is that we are all unique vibratory beings. And when I oftentimes would begin a workshop, I would ask, okay, how many of you are allergic to penicillin? And Paul, anywhere from 5% to 20% to sometimes even more, depending upon the group, would raise their hand. I said, okay, if we perceive that everything in the universe is vibration, then penicillin can be perceived of as a series of frequencies. That for 80% of you or more is a healing vibration. But for 5 to 20% of you, 
is toxic. And I think this is an incredible metaphor for almost everything I have ever found. I simply have not found anything, whether it's a sound or a substance, a food, what have you, that is going to work for everybody the same way. Uh, have you? Not other than breath and water. Uh, breath, and I'm sorry, sleep. breath and water. Yes, <laughs> I was thinking about that. That's true. Breath and water. Yes, but. <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, your point is well taken. I mean, aside from the, the, the four elements and, and the fact that we all need space and, and, and imbibe ourselves in consciousness, um, everything is so absolutely unique. And in my teachings on diet, I make the very important point and show many methods for fine tuning your diet and listening to your body and not following diet books and diet experts because you can expert yourself into a disease. There you go. And so I think, you know, these are very, you know, and, and th that's one of the problems that we have. We still have people that don't trust their own inner experience or their own inner guidance. And so they keep reaching out for some kind of mommy or daddy figure to tell them what to do. But it's really important, I think, to grow up and take responsibility for our need to find out, you know, certain drugs don't work for certain people, certain foods, certain medicines, as you're implying. And I think, a lot of people get themselves into a lot of trouble with their health and even their mental, emotional well-being because they are not paying attention to what their own inner consciousness or their own body is telling them instead of listening to somebody else. And, and I think that's really an important concept across the board as well as with sound. I mean, what if we empowered ourselves to honor this? And what if we take a supplement, hear a sound? do something and have a bad experience and go, wow, that didn't resonate with me. And I'm not talking about trying a new food and going, nah, I don't like that. I'm talking about literally eating some food and becoming violently ill. I mean, how brilliant would it be if we somehow were able to empower ourselves to go, well, that didn't work for me. I'll try something else. There is this incredible smorgasbord of sound. There's this smorgasbord of food. There are all sorts of different things. And probably we can find something that does help put us in balance and allows us to have some sort of sovereignty for ourselves. What do you think of that? I think that's where we've got to go. Because if we don't start with our own body, we're never going to have the intestinal fortitude to stand up for ourselves as a family or as a society or as a as a nation or as a culture, which is critical in the world right now. I mean, it all begins with the individual. Any group of people is a collection of individuals. And if they're all still stuck in the child, child archetype, feeding off somebody else's breast without thinking for themselves, we're, we're in deep trouble. And I think as you were saying before, that, you know, once you experience something, once you use yourself as a laboratory and you experience it, whether it's sound or whatever, because sound can be a wonderful metaphor for a lot of different things. But once you experience it, then it's real for you. That's why we can read tons and tons of books, millions of words. But as I like to say, you know, a, uh, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words, a uh, sound is worth an encyclopedic amount of uh, pictures. So, you know, once you've really experienced something, because otherwise it's just a mental plane construct and it's not real for us. Yeah, I think that's very important. The last one, and this is one, Paul, that is going to seem so simple. And it took me probably 15 plus years to learn it. And that is this. Silence is golden. Mm. Silence is the place where the true vibrational resonances of the sounds we experience have the time to assimilate and basically manifest shift and change. I like to say that silence is the yin to the yang of sound. And that indeed, if you think about it, the word silent and the word listen are anagrams. Mm. Almost as though we have to listen within in that place of stillness to get really, as you were saying, that sort of direct guidance for ourselves. And it's something so many people in the field of sound become so enamored with the great bliss of how great it feels to play music and sing and do this and that, that they don't understand the importance of silence because silence is really the key. If you don't allow proper, adequate silence to basically accompany the sound, 
you're not doing it justice. So when we do sound activities, we'll usually do almost an equal amount of silent time to assimilate the experience. Yeah, I love that. Are you familiar with the Sufi master Hazrat Inyat Khan? You betcha. So the question that I'm going to pose or the statement I'm going to pose and let you respond to it. And I've got his entire collected works. I've studied it for years. Me too. Amazing, amazing human being. My yep. God. And uh, there's a great book called Universal Sufism. I can't remember the author's name. It's something like Witten or something like that. But in both the Universal Sufism book and in Inyat Khan's, Hazrat Inyat Khan's teachings, they say that the spiritual meaning of sound is something that encompasses all frequencies. So everything in the electromagnetic spectrum from light to sound to infrared to gamma rays to x-rays in the Sufi conception of creation, that's all categorized as sound. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that, because a lot of people don't understand that when mystics are speaking of sound or someone like Hazrat Inyat Khan and they're talking about the formative forces of the universe, they're not separating audible sound like we think of it from the rest of the frequency range. So ohm in this conception means every possible frequency, which I say is zero negative all the way to zero positive, which is infinite. Well, I must be a mystic of sound, which some people have called me because I am in total agreement. I love Hazrat Inayat Khan. In fact, did a little bit of work with his son, Pir Vilayat Khan. I don't know if you ever encountered mm. him at all. Lovely no, I haven't, boy. but I think there's a mention of him in one of the books, but that's it. Yeah, a lovely being. And I had actually, he was the man who is responsible for basically turning me on to harmonics, which is, I'm going to tell the story just because it's the flow. I love it. It's about 1986, and I have now really gotten into the whole aspect of healing. Not too many things going on, but there is a gigantic conference in Washington, D.C. called Healing in Our Times that is sponsored by the Sufi healing order, but it's got all of these major, if I mention people's names, a lot of people wouldn't even know about them now, but a woman named, for example, Thelma Moss, who was huge into uh, electromagnetic energy and curling photography, man named Robert Becker, who's the guy who wrote The oh, yeah. Body Electric, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, other, and Pierre Vlade Khan is there, and I went specifically to see him because he's talking about healing with light and sound. So he's talking, and at the end, he says, any questions? And I'm, there must have been 5,000 people in this giant auditorium. I'm jumping out of my seat, waving my hand, waving my hand. He won't call on me. He won't call on me. Oh. <laughs> finally, at the end, I make my way down to him, and finally, I'm in front of him. I say, oh, my God. Pier of light, pure of light, is there a major relationship between sound and the chakras? He says, yes, I think that there is, but I think the true healing power of sound lies in harmonics. I said, mm. oh, great, thank you. And I walk away and I'm clueless because all I knew about harmonics was that it was a way of basically deadening a string in order to tune my guitar. And I thought perhaps he was telling me that if I put my guitar in tune, it would be healing. But I didn't think so. I walked into the bookstore there. They had a bookstore. And there was a cassette that said the harmonic choir. Mm. Didn't have a clue what it was. Had a Sony Walkman with me. I'm sitting in my, at the time, tie and jacket in a crowded hotel lobby. I put this thing on. I listen to about, ooh, 30 seconds of it, and I go out of my body. And then all of a sudden, next thing I'm aware of is the uh, tape clicks off. And I said, wow, I got to find out more about that. And indeed, my first book that I wrote is called Healing Sounds, The Power of harmonics. But that brings into, you know, talking about the Sufis, and I want to honor Pierre Vlayat and his incredible dad, Hazrat Inayat Khan, who, uh, one of the things that I, I'm so glad we're talking about this, because these are giants of the people in sound and the people in consciousness, their, their shoulders that we're standing on, and most people are unaware of them. So let us give thanks for bringing up these extraordinary beings. Oh, oh which reminds me of another giant, another Sufi, who has, I don't, I don't think he's alive anymore, but his voice was so damn incredible. He, he could sound like four people singing at once. Have you ever heard Hazrat Inyat Fateh Ali Khan? No, I didn't, but I'm sure oh he, was my a God. he must have been a harmonic singer, which is fellow David Hikes, who is the uh, basically founder of the Harmonic Choir, and just brilliant, brilliant stuff, crazy. And my first book focused 
on uh, vocal harmonics, as well as using sound for healing. And it just had its 30th anniversary release in uh, October because the company, it never went out of print. But I said, listen, it needs to be re-released and reboots because a lot of people picked up a lot of the important things in it. But the one thing they still don't get is the phenomena of harmonics. And the book did come out. And one of the things I was able to do this time, as opposed to 1992, when such things didn't exist, was I had and I gave them over 100 minutes of audible downloads that people could listen to so that they could experience what harmonics sound like. Because, you know, once you've heard it, your life can be changed. Yeah, you know, Hazrat Inyat Fateh Ali Khan was a Sufi master, and what he did was he took Sufi prayers, sung them, and put music to them. It's very a lot of his music's very danceable, and he did it to inspire young people to feel and experience the Sufi prayers in a way that would work for their minds. And it's incredible. He was a big fat guy, but my God, Jonathan! Oh, I know him. Sure, of course, of yeah. course. Brilliant. It sounds like Brilliant. yeah. It, he it, literally, I've you know, I've got a very high end stereo, and yeah, when yeah. I listen, you can sound like there's three or four people singing at once, and he's doing it all with his voice, and it is mind blowing. And this guy can sing the scale from oh. high to low. Yeah, no, he he, brilliant. I mean, now I I got who it was, of course. And it, it's interesting because the Sufi tradition, uh, the Islamic call to prayer, is really loaded with harmonics when they when they do their things. So it's almost natural to their ears because our listening, talking about, you know, being in silence, our listening is so important because our ear literally affects the way that our speech and our voice occurs. There was a brilliant doctor in the 1990s, French fellow who passed away by the name of Alfred Tomatis, or Tomatis, depending upon your, uh, well, you know, your accent, who, who basically had the Tomatis effect. He was considered the Einstein of the ear. And he, the Tomatis effect basically says that the voice can only duplicate those harmonics that the ear can hear. That's very interesting. Yeah. So if you hear somebody who's got a voice like this, a voice like this, that's because that's not a vocal problem. It's an auditory hearing problem. And if you shift and open up the ear to hear a higher level of frequency, you literally are able to change the tonality. And as you know, wow, I'm just thinking this, I don't think I ever said this before, but as you know, our voice is one of the major purveyors of creating a vibrational resonance within ourselves. We speak all the time when we do this. And when you shift and change that, you change your very vibratory field. Oftentimes with regard to harmonics, I say, okay, we are oftentimes wearing sonic earplugs or earmuffs. And as we, you know, when you begin to open up to hear harmonics, it's a little bit like taking these earmuffs off and this full spectrum of sound begins to invade our psyche. And it, it, it is life changing because if you change the way that you perceive sound and the way that you make sound, you've changed one of your five essential sens senses. And that's like gaining a superpower. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to tell you about Wild Pasture's amazing meat delivery service. They have beef, chicken, pork, and wild-caught fish. My family and I have been enjoying their meat for quite some time now, and I just couldn't wait to tell you about it any longer. We had an amazing barbecue this weekend, and I'm still high off the meat. And they use a whole network of regenerative farms, which means that you're getting a different ecosystem from each farm, which means a different nutritional profile, which means nutritional diversity, which means health and vitality, which is exactly what we need right now in the world for ourselves and our families so we can all make a difference in the world. And Matt Smith's going to tell us more about this amazing company, Wild Pastures, about their offering and how you can get it. Thank you, Matt. Thanks so much, Paul. And I'm excited to tell your listeners what they can get today and how we can help them out. So, you know, as you know, pastured meats are crazy expensive. And so our goal with Wild Pastures is to tap into this network of regenerative farmers and to finally create the solution of where we can get the highest quality meats delivered straight to your door for the most affordable prices around. And so we're on average seeing that we are 40% cheaper than any other delivery option out there. And that our customers have reportedly saved, on average, $1,000 on their grocery bill from meat alone. 
And so Wild Pastures is a regenerative meat delivery service that is solving this problem. And you can get 100% grass-fed and finished, as well as pasture-raised pork and poultry and wild-caught seafood from Alaska delivered straight to your door. So it's far more convenient. It's far more environmentally friendly because we're using regenerative farms entirely. We don't use feedlots ever. So the, the nutrition profiles are way better. You can definitely taste the difference. I know we were talking about this on our uh, just before we hopped on, you having a Father's Day barbecue and, and how incredible the pasture-raised chicken and beef short ribs were. And you can really taste the difference, right? I'm and still so, high. <laughs> and so our goal is to remove the roadblock from people's minds that if they want to eat healthy, it's too expensive. And so that's where Wild Pastures comes in, is we are delivering with our own fleets of trucks whenever possible. We haven't raised our meat prices in over three years at this point. And we're really just creating convenience for the consumer and kind of being the high tide that rises all ships. If we can opt more people into a system like this, the cost stays down for everybody. And so there is a myriad of benefits that go into that. And so today, if your listeners want to try Wild Pastures and taste the difference and experience what it's like, go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul Check or click the link in the show notes and save 20% off for life, plus get free shipping for life plus get $15 off your first box. That's a mind-blowing deal. I can't even <laughs> imagine. I mean, I've never heard of an offer like that. And, you know, most people will hear an offer like that and think, this can't be that good. But I'm telling you, it's not, it's not only that good, it's really good. Or I would not be sharing this on my podcast. I think everybody needs to get a hold of Wild Pastures for their family, for their vitality, for their longevity, and for the future of this planet. So thank you guys very much. So Matt, Matt, just repeat the website again. Sure. Just go to wildpastures.com forward slash Paul check or visit the link in the show notes and get 20% off for life plus free shipping for life plus $15 off your first box so you can try it. You'll be glad you did. Just because I don't want to assume everybody understands the word harmonics and I know you're an expert at it. To me, harmonics is the overtones and undertones of a given string or note. Yeah. Could, could you maybe tell us the technical definition of harmonics so we know everyone knows what exactly you mean? Uh, yes, I uh, can. And also, I want to uh, perhaps at this time would be perfect to bring our attention to a uh, YouTube video I have called uh, Awakening, which is a sound from uh, an album I did called The Divine Name, which is, this is a whole another topic, but it's a basically a harmonically related sequence of vowel sounds that is universal in principle and takes the sounds from the crown to the root and then back up again based upon the harmonics in it. But it's fabulous to listen to. But to define it, whenever we hear sound, we don't hear single frequencies. We actually are hearing composites of mathematically related frequencies. The first frequency and the second frequency vibrates twice as fast, next one three times as fast as so the whole number sequence. These, are, these occur whenever we make a sound or whenever an instrument is played. But there are these things called formants, F-O-R-M-A-N-T-S, and they are the most predominant harmonics that occur when we speak or when we make sound. And they are so unique and original that our voice is as unique and original as our fingerprints. So it is the harmonics that create this. Harmonics, if you like, are the colors of sound. They are responsible for what is called the timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E, or the color of sound. And for example, they took the harmonics away from a violin, an oboe, and a piano, and had people listen to it, and you couldn't tell them apart. Mm. They did this in a, as a laboratory experiment, but obviously we can do it because it's the harmonics of the instruments that create their tone color, the color of sound. It's phenomenal and so important, Paul, because a lot of people are be, have become frequencyists. They, mm -hmm. you know, uh, say, "Oh, this is a just specific frequency," and I'll do this for a second. This is like. And, and here we have, this is a little bit close to a single tone frequency because it was a tuning fork, which is about as close as we can uh, come to. You can have one single tone created in a laboratory through a sine wave generator, but even that tuning fork was replete 
with a lot of different overtones. I don't have the ability, uh, but much less than, for example, our voice. But if we begin to understand that the universe is, every sound is replete with harmonics, I think we will grow into a much greater level of consciousness, awareness, and understanding of sound, life, the universe, and everything. If we begin to understand, you've got the awareness of the fact that harmonics are, if you like, an essential part of sound, but most people are clueless. Uh, To me, the harmonics of sound are very similar if you think of food. Like if you add peanut butter to celery, it creates a more full experience. (laughs) Whereas if you just hear a tuning fork versus, say, a flute or a drum, then the fullness of the experience, it seems to capture more of our being than a a sharp frequency does. I hit this bowl. Yeah. You can hear it wavering, and if I were yeah. to even make it sing, well, it's not going to sing now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it wants special attention. Okay. That's yeah. Thing. But regardless, it's so interesting. Once again, the way that we can hold a crystal in light and how a prism, for example, will break up the bandwidth of the electromagnetic spectrum into the different colors. Well, our voice, for example, can learn how to do this. Once again, if you can listen to the um, recording of the divine name awakening that, you know, perhaps we can have a link to, that's great. I will attempt to do it a little bit right now, but uh, this is just so people can hear a little bit. I'm going to hit a couple of notes. Now, I don't know how that might have come out, but could you hear some different tones? Yeah, yeah. It's almost like they start feeding off of each other, too. It's, yeah. it, it actually creates inside of me a, an image more like water, roll, like waves rolling over each other than it does a, a linear type experience. Mm. Yes, interesting. And of course, there are people. Uh, and I used to be quite good at doing it. I'm a little out of practice. I'm more in practice of doing the Tibetan deep voice, the undertone of... Which is not something I normally teach people, though. The other one you can pick up real easy by simply going from, you know, I'm going to go from oo to e, and you can hear. Just simply going from one vowel sound to another because harmonics, the formants of the vowel sounds, are really the thing that give us our, uh, you know, sonic mojo. Very interesting. I wish I could get real deep down in those belly sounds like you do, but I don't think my balls hang low enough for that. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a funny story in this one. I had, uh, in my interest in harmonics, I also found out that these Tibetan monks did this extraordinary sound. And so I spent about a year trying to figure out how to make the sound. I would hum and whistle and try all this stuff, but it wasn't there. And then I had the privilege of being one of the first Americans to bring this group of ancient tantric monks, Tibetan monks, who were traveling for the first time ever in the United States when I was in Boston. We brought them into a recording studio and they did their thing. I took the cassette, back in cassette land, of the monks, went home, put it in my cassette player, fell asleep in my crystal grid meditation room, woke up the next morning and... And that was crazy. I walked into the studio. The fellow who I was my partner at the time in engineering said, hey, he said, no. So he got it too. But a month, <laughs> okay, a month later, the monks come back to the studio just to say hello. They're going to do a concert. We, the, the, <laughs> the Rinpoche, the head of the monastery, comes in and uh, we monked him. We went, no. And he says something to the uh, translator. Translator says, and the translator looks at it. He says, Rinpoche say, best in West. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I 
I love it. My son, Paul Jr., he's he's 43 now. He's not so young, but he can do that really well. I'm, mm. I love him and I will sometimes chant and tone together. And he has to do those deep things, but I can't do it. But I love those things because they take you down sort of down even below your root chakra. It feels like you're down inside the earth, you know? Yeah, it's it's actually an undertone, which was said to be usually in most of the musical books, until recently at least, they said undertones were sort of a figment of people's imagination, but they aren't. Basically, just as a sound will produce these overtones, undertones or sub sonic frequencies also occur. And what a blessing that your son is able to do that. And I'm not going to ask you how he learned, but obviously he heard them and something just triggered in, in him. I, I, only, I only did one. I, I was empowered later on by a uh, different Tibetan uh, abbot uh, who was with these touring monks and uh, he empowered me to teach. And I only did one workshop teaching people how to do it. I sort of had figured out certain ways of doing it, but I got calls from people later on, who in the middle of the night would get up to get a glass of water and all of a sudden go, no. <laughs> and at the time, shortly after, I, ha I had a friend by the name of Don Campbell. Most people don't know of Don now. He passed from Oh, uh, oh, oh, Don Campbell, the music theorist. I've right, got right, some of his great music and his books. Book. Right, the Mozart effect. So Don. Yes, yes. Right. Don was a good friend of mine. In fact, he introduced me to my wife. So blessed be. <laughs> oh, there and, you go. And um, Don and I were, he had taken me to hear these uh, Gregorian monks. And at one point I told him the story and he said, that's an example of harmonic transmission. Yeah. And I love that where just the vibrations of a person will somehow empower somebody else. And I, I'd like to suggest that this oftentimes goes on, perhaps on a silent level, with a lot of gurus uh, and the audience where they don't even have to say a word. They can be sitting in meditation. Everybody will be levitating because of that energy field. Well, Rumi says the greatest lover is the silent lover and the greatest teacher is the silent teacher. So there must be something to it. Nice. Now, a couple of thoughts that came to me, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on. John Stuart Reed helped me with one of the chapters I'm writing in my new book, and I've studied a fair bit of his writings and videos and audios, and I have one of his cymoscopes here. Oh, great. Yeah. And, and one of the things he brings up, and he's quite adamant about, he almost seems like it irritates him, is we have a tendency to think of sound as a wave and draw it as a sine wave, but he'll he's tell you right off the bat. He's a bubble believer. Yes, yes. So, you know, for me, sound feels wave-like. I mean, I understand he his science of it, but I'm just curious, how important is that distinction to you or how important, uh, it, does it mean anything or what, where do you sit on that? John is a dear friend. He's been a student of mine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I met him back in the uh, early 2000s in England when he came to study with me. You know, he well may be right. But if you try to talk to a, a acousticians and yeah. sonic scientists, they will look at you like you're from another planet. So he may be right, but it's not accepted right now. So I don't know where to go with this one, except that it's, pro it's you know, he may be right, but I, I don't think it matters that much. It's easier for me to explain to people that sound is a waveform. If I start saying sound is a bubble, they're going to be stopped at A, and I can't even get to a Z. One of the neat things, though, about his explanation of that, because I've actually got the diagrams and everything. Yeah, no, it, I think it, it's correct. In my chapter, what the point I'm making, though, is that he talks about how the sound bubbles collide with each other and it produces infrared energy, which goes infinitely. And so when we're actually making sounds with our voice, he, he describes how we're actually talking to the whole universe. And it really, because the infrared energy is light, it goes on forever out there. And I could go into the deeper science of that, but I, I think that's enough to make a point. I think that's a, it tells us that we're all co-creators in the entire universe. I love it, Paul, but also John didn't mention, maybe because uh, the concept of harmonics, which he's well aware of, is uh, perhaps to him more difficult than trying to explain the concept of sound as bubbles, but sound as it continues to double and double and double conceptually goes into infinity because of the harmonics. And indeed, the concept of Jacob's ladder or the stairway to heaven 
a lot of metaphysicians would perceive that harmonics are the stairway to heaven. So indeed, talking about sound turning into light. And I actually did have the experience when I was down in the Mayan temple of Palenque during a time called the Harmonic Convergence. I don't know if you remember that one. I do, yeah. And I was with a group of people and a brujo. He was kind of like a, uh, he wasn't a shaman. He was a brujo. He was sort of tied to the energy spot of Palenque. But he somehow tuned into my uh, aspect of uh, being interested in sound. So he took us to this underground temple there that had not been totally unearthed. And he took he had his flashlight on and he took us into this place that was interesting to look at. It had been ex- excavated. And then he basically says to me, uh, points to the uh, archway, the doorway, and he says, make sound. And then he turns off the light. And Paul, I was in deeper darkness than I'd ever been in my life. And I went, mm-hmm. and the room became illuminated. That's amazing. And okay, and then he turns off the light and we leave. And I didn't say anything. Nobody said anything. And Afterwards, I said to the, you know, there were probably about a dozen people. I said, did anybody see anything? They said, yes, we could see each other. And the room became illuminated. And then as I write about in my book, Healing Sounds, that first book about the concept of sonoluminescence or the idea of creating light through sound. And here's, here's one that most people don't know about. But here I'm holding in my hand a quartz crystal. If you were to take two quartz crystals together and rub them together, which you don't want to do unless the crystal gives you uh, permission. But uh, (laughs) because exactly because they're alive. Right. But if you do that and you do it in a darkened room, the crystals will glow. That's I'm going to try that. That's a cool concept. Ask the uh, it's real. Uh, Make sure the room is dark and also realize that, you know, Make sure I say, hey, you know, I've got a couple of crystals that uh, have given up their, uh, uh, you know, you don't really hurt it too much, but that's no. it's an interesting phenomena. I don't want to suggest people start rubbing their crystals together. Use your crystals as sacred things, and you don't want to be abrasive. It's probably because they're piezoelectric. Isn't that, that exactly what's triggering? It. It's yeah. piezoelectric going into sonoluminescence. And in fact, there was a fellow by the name of Marcel Vogel. I don't know if you ever heard of him. I know of him. Yeah, I've studied him a lot. Yeah. And at one point, I I still am very heavily into crystals, but I just don't share a lot of the stuff. And I have a a Vogel cut crystal right here, custom cut based on Marcel Vogel's. Very expensive, but very powerful. I I had one that was cut by Vogel, then later by his son. But the, the, the one by, and it was very, very interesting. At the time, he was only create, cutting four sided crystals because he found that they were uh, basically, that anything more would be too powerful. But I think we've evolved in consciousness. But real quick, I told him, and I wrote him, this is also in the book Healing Sounds, about the fact that there was a person from the Harmonic Choir who I mentioned to you, who, I, um, who had come up to Boston where I was at, and I had a number of crystals, and I had them. Uh, try a phenomena that I had experienced, which is to sing harmonics into crystals. And the fact is the crystal would amplify specific harmonics. And she did it. And because she was a non-believer, it freaked her out. She was literally uh, almost had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and later, later on, I called Marcel and I said, Marcel, I said, I, you know, this has been happening. Can you validate this? Because it sounds weird. And he said, congratulations, young man, which I was at the time. It says, you have rediscovered an ancient Atlantean technique. I said, very cool. So I share that with you. So you were singing to the crystal and what happened? I'll do this one. And this is not a great one, but I go, hmm. Could you hear how that one harmonic popped out from there? I don't know if... uh... Yeah, and also, I'm clairvoyant. So when you were doing that, it was shooting out something I've not seen before. You know what sperm looks like. they Like a little tiny um, tadpole, you know, like a little head with a little tail. As you were doing it in my third eye, I was seeing what looked like the symbol for fecundity, like a sperm like shooting out made a light coming out of the crystal when you reach sort of a peak energy there it was shooting these little sperm like light things out of it 
thank you. And that's, uh, that's beautiful. And of course, I was just doing that as an example, rather than having the intention of projecting sound and having the sound go into the crystal, basically turn into a higher level of energy and be used for healing. Because this is a very powerful technique that uh, I used to teach, but, you know, I've forgotten more than most people know. And this is not Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah, I haven't shared I haven't shared this in decades. Thank you. I'm glad. I love it. Getting some good stuff on the podcast that's not on other podcasts. So come listen to me and Jonathan get the good stuff. Now I got another off the kind of beaten path thing here. Uh, Having studied a lot of quantum physics and related sciences, because I study everything to do with the human being and the human psyche and that you need to be a holistic health practitioner. Most people don't really think about this, but there's actually quite a bit in the literature. First, we, th- to start with, you know, the, there's plenty in quantum physics to show that matter is really light woven into matter. So uh, light is entangled, creating matter. So light becomes mass. And, you know, you could look at E equals MC squared as sort of a basis for that. But there's also a lot in the newer literature on phonons, phonons as being interesting, yeah, yeah, as as creative, not just photons. So I wondered what your thoughts. Maybe you could describe a little bit about the phonon photon relationship and how we should consider that as part of our understanding of the creative forces. I don't feel qualified on that level. I understand the concept. It's hypothetical right now. Is Almost everything in quantum physics is, so I, I can't go, you could probably explain it further than me, except that let's, let's perceive that most of the universe is vacuum, or seemingly vacuum. It's yeah. got energetic form, but it's, you know, the, the, the molecules and all this other stuff. And therefore, you know, people like to say, well, you know, there's photons and phonons. I love it. It makes sense to me. I've Googled it. It's theoretical. And I like like John uh, John Stewart reads uh, sound bubbles. I, I I it makes sense to me. I don't like to argue with anybody, and you get people who are very rigid in their sciences and their understandings. And I go, okay, you know, if, if that doesn't resonate with you, I'm sure there's much more that we can find. But I, that the idea of a phonon or basically a small particle of sound that seems to even have some density uh, to it. Uh, although it's you know microcosmically small, I love it. But there's something something going on. There is something going on. If we perceive that sound is not and the, here's where we where you get into a problem. If you talk about everything, every uh, electromagnetic frequency being sound, we're cool. If you talk about sound as only falling that which is uh, within the audible range then you begin to run, run into difficulties and, you know, got not much more to say about that, except that, um, suppose it's both. If you go back to the beginning of quantum physics, Albert Einstein and, and Max Planck and, and Wolfgang Pauli and Heisenberg and all those guys, the, the photon was identified as a quantum or yes. a unit, a unit of energy, right? And so to me, what I'm hearing them say is that a phonon is a unit of sound energy, just like a photon is a unit of energy. And just as things can be created out of photons, they can also be created out of phon- phonons. That's the way I understood it. Okay, so I'm going to jump for a second into, ah, Paul, what are you doing to me? Okay, so we are this month talking about sacred sound. And I don't think we're actually going to get into this. I think this is going to be next month because it became too large. But the idea of morphogenetic fields or morphic fields being created by sacred sound. That, Sheldrake. Yeah, that's Sheldrake and more. I, and I, I, I've had the pleasure of, uh, you know, <laughs> meeting and knowing. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, Sheldrake, did you know his wife, Jill Purse, was one yeah, of the absolutely. Great, great harmonic singers on the planet? She wrote one of my favorite books, The Sacred, Sacred Spiral. Spiral. Have you ever seen? What a beautiful book, man. And that's deeply metaphysical, but also scientific. I mean, when I found out that was Rupert Sheldrake's wife in my mind, it went, it has to be because it would take a woman like that to be his wife. Well, it's so funny talking about the uh, what I'm going to be doing in terms of the uh, play, uh, play a little video as part of the teaching 
is I, I'm doing something called the Merkaba of sound, which is based upon the sacred spiral and the frequencies that make this up, which is the phi ratio, which can actually be condensed into two different levels. In fact, as I'm saying it, perhaps we can, uh, you can find the Merkaba of sound on uh, the uh, YouTube and uh, we can just put a link to that one. Yeah, what what is just just since we're talking about it a few times now, what is the URL? What what's the YouTube channel? How do they find it? Jonathan Goldman official. All right, that's easy. I watched your video, which we'll talk about later, but I watched your video on Sound for World Healing, which was lovely. It was a nice short video, but it was really beautiful. Yeah, I find you know, sadly, uh I find that most people our, our attention span has become so condensed these days that I know. uh you know, so the Sound sound song that I do. We keep it to an hour, and we have different things in it, including planetary healing thing. And a friend of mine, who's very well known uh, psychoacoustician, said to me, "Oh, you should just let it go as long as it can go." And I say, most people, most people, not for this show because this is so fascinating, but most people have a limit of about ten seconds, and most of the time, (laughs) we try to keep it to about five or ten minutes. Yeah, I know you can see because all the videos platforms keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And I'm like, what are we going to do when we're down to one second? We're just going to look at each other and go, uh, I guess that's it. I think it's a problem. And one of the reasons I do longer form podcasts, because I don't believe in fast food education. I'm like, if you want to learn something, you've got to pay attention and be committed to it. Or you're just going to walk around being a snapshot of everybody else's miniature ideas that have no depth and and essence to them. So I I just personally, I I know that the people that are going to change the world are the people that have enough focus to really do something in their lives. So my podcast is for the people out there that want to be proactive, not just it's monkey minds, you know? Totally. The old monkey mind. One of the most amazing Bioptimizers products I've ever used is Biome Breakthrough, which used to be called Leaky Gut Guardian. I can honestly say I use it every single day. I have a morning routine. I put a scoop in with two fresh squeezed limes. I put a little bit of other ingredients that I like in there. And I'll tell you what, If any of you have read my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and you know how to read your poops, well, Biome Breakthrough makes for some really nice poopy policemen. I've got Wade here to tell us what's so unique about it, but I want to tell you right up front, I love the stuff. I don't go anywhere without it, and I keep a lot of it on hand so I don't run out. So, Wade, what is it that's making that product so effective? Well, first and foremost, we have to look at what's happening in the population at large. And Harvard just released an extensive study demonstrating that virtually Everyone has some degree of leaky gut, and that means the gut permeability of our intestines is leaking toxins into the system, which are causing immuno responses. Now, some people that's sneezing or allergies, but then it can move on to more inflammatory conditions. And anybody that's checked out your work understands this. The question is, how do you actually seal the gut so that you can stop this from happening? And we have a partnership with Birch International University in Croatia, where we have a team of PhD scientists working on this. And we've been able to combine a unique product called IGY Max, which is a patented egg-based product that enhances your gut health and reverses the damage that can be done by all these toxins that are leading to leaky gut. But when we combined it with some specific probiotics, they work synergistically together to be able to repair leaky gut and literally hours as opposed to going through an extensive protocol. Now, we can't stop ourselves from experiencing all the toxins in our world or food, air, water, you name it. It's coming from everywhere nowadays. So what we have to look at is, is, well, how do we manage the damage, if you will, that we are taking, even if we're following, you know, the highest levels of, of food hygiene and, you know, conscientiousness. And so what's happened is Biome Breakthrough has been able to be proven in the lab and in folks, research papers will be coming out very soon to demonstrate this. And that's why we've called it Biome Breakthrough. We're able to actually repair and stop the leaky gut from happening with the combination of IGY Max. It's a unique set of probiotics and we're happy to deliver it to people. We're very excited. We can try it. It's a money back guarantee. If you don't feel better, if your poops aren't better, if you don't say, wow, my, my inflammatory conditions in my gut are going down, uh, you get your money back. So it's really easy to get. You go to biomebreakthrough.com slash living40. You'll get 
put in Paul 10, you get a 10% discount on this and any other products that we supply at Bioptimizers. I can't recommend it enough. I love this stuff. And it actually tastes good too, which is unique. So thank you very much once again for making such an amazing product. I'm really excited to be able to offer it to everybody. Enjoy Biome Breakthrough. I think it's important for the whole family. Paul, just for a moment, I want to get into another important, I do this normally right after talking about the four pillars of sound healing. I just want to bring this up as part of the whole gestalt of sound, because we have gone into different corners of the universe, and perhaps we haven't spoken about the quantum nature of sound, but that is in a moment. But right now, on the, purely on the physical level of sound, there are two major ways that sound affects us. The first is called psychoacoustics. Yes. And that's where the sound goes into our ear, into our brain, affecting our nervous system, our heart rate, our respiration, of course, our brain waves. And whether that's music or you and I talking, that's the way that we are most frequently affected by sound. And when I say this, I also like to add that if we can project intention with our sound, which you can very, very easily, and we do most of the time, whether we're aware of it or not, we can use the conversational voice as a healing instrument if we project kindness and compassion in our voice. And this is something I just always like to suggest to anybody who's listening to be aware of your conversational voice and what you project. Mm. And have you ever been to a party and somebody comes up to you and goes, lovely to see you, and you feel like you've been psychically slimed? Because the words yeah. might have said one thing, but the energy yeah. that they said was something else. And we can pick, pick it up and we can feel it. So we, it's important to be aware. And particularly, uh, if you can get sensitive enough, you can certainly uh, read a lot of our politicians and whether there's truth <laughs> in what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, which the answer, unfortunately, is usually not. That's the old saying. You, how do you know when a politician's telling a lie? Because their lips are moving. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Right. So Thank we, God for RFK. <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, well, this is a whole another discussion. Indeed, but <laughs> yeah. blessed be. And the other way that sound affects us is called vibroacoustics. And this is where sound goes into our body, affecting us on a cellular level, affecting us on a molecular level, affecting us on a DNA level. And as sound grows more and more in terms of our awareness in science and medicine, most of the time the focal point is on the psychoacoustics. People stick people in MRIs, play different music, and see what parts of their brain light up, which is great. But I'm going to give you a quote from the New York Times Science Section, February 8th, 1988. Sound shaped into dazzling tool can make, break, or rearrange molecular structure, drum roll, and levitate objects. Yes. Okay, I've so we're, we're talking about an energy that can rearrange molecular structure. I people say, what sort of conditions can sound heal? And I say, well, conceptually, if you can rearrange molecular structure, what can't you do? Now, with this in mind, I, I'm going to suggest that our friend John Stuart Reed, a lot of his sound really focuses on the vibroacoustic effects of sound. I'm particularly impressed by his work with uh, blood cells and showing how uh, sound vibrations will regenerate red blood cells, and now he's doing regenerating white blood cells. But that's the actual vibration of the sound. And I think that just that's something I think scientists will be getting into more and more, Paul. But um, it's so very, very important. Uh, you, all right, you, I know we're on the same page. You'll appreciate this. Back in 1986, I was in a place called Ludenscheid, Germany, for the first international uh, meeting of the Society for Music and Medicine. And it was a society ah, composed of 90% PhDs and MDs. So the, I was Dr. Goldman, whether or not I was. I, you know, and, uh, but what was so interesting, and there was some brilliant stuff going on there, brilliant stuff. But you know, it was funded by a pharmaceutical company. 
Well, that's I'm, probably because they want to capture the information to harvest it. You got it exactly. They wanted to see if they had any trouble with any sort of competition from a sound or frequency instead of a, a pill. So you're totally right there. And so nothing has changed. So I you know trying to get the funding to do these multi-million dollar research things can be challenging. Yeah. And often when they fund it, it's because they actually want you to do the research to see what they need to compensate from people. Right. And as you also know, I can tell we're on the same page, most research is done with the end result, the end game in mind before they begin it. So yep. 90% of the time, they're going to get that end game. And if it doesn't fall there, they'll just throw out the information and do it, do it a different way. Yeah, I know. You know, John Baptiste, the guy that did all the original research showing that homeopathic doses were more potent even when there wasn't a single atom of the molecule in the dose. And, and he was a world-renowned scientist head of a major scientific association in France, and they just completely trashed him and tortured the guy. Then the medical community kept redoing his experiments and saying they didn't work. And uh, he got so pissed off, he bought a robot and had, had the robot do the experiment 1,000 times and got exactly the same result every time. And they still ignored him and still kept saying their scientists couldn't reproduce the research. Point being is, unfortunately, there are dark forces out there that don't want us to have access to, you know, our own healing, innate healing tools. But I think that's exactly why we have conversations like this and inspire people to connect to their voice and connect to their body. And one of the things that you were talking about earlier, sound is vibration. Now they have hearing aids that, that actually don't even work on your ear. They go into your bone and the vibration goes right into your skull and it enhances the people's ability to hear even when their eardrums aren't working. Which brings into our effect our friend that I mentioned before, Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who taught us that there are three ways of listening. Air conduction, which is the sound going into the ear. Skin conduction and bone conduction. And he was a real pioneer in there. But I got to jump now. You were just talking about something. And it's time to bring out our friend Roy Royal Rife. Oh, I love Royal Rife. Yeah. What a genius. And they took away his microscopes and put him under. Yeah. And I mean, he was a man. And he, just for those who don't know, Rife was probably a madman because he, <laughs> he apparently would sit at these uh, he would use special polarized light uh, using uh, crystal uh, lenses, and he would observe bacteria and viruses. But and he cancer take, cells. He would take, yes, uh, he would take basically radio frequencies. He didn't actually use sound. He used radio frequencies, and he basically would work with three different frequencies and triangulate them and move them slightly, and he apparently would sit at the microscope for hours and hours and hours, slightly moving, slightly moving, until he get, came up with what he termed the death ray of the uh, virus or the bacteria, and it would explode, which is also, I'm going to do a quick aside and say there are two different methods of using sound for healing. One is to is constructive, where you use the vibrations of the healthy organ, you reinforce it. This is, for example, the work of Dr. Peter Guy Manners and his Sima therapy. And mm -hmm. then the other is, shall we say, destructive, which is using um, the voice to like shatter glass or the walls of Jericho, or in Rife's case, blowing up the uh, cells. So he did this and he was very successful. And then ultimately the uh, AMA got uh, a hold of him. And I know that this is true. And uh, the AA and basically said, give us your instrument so that we can have it in the hospital. And he says, no, if, you, if I give it, uh, you know, the, the instruments, you'll control it. I want to have, be a free man and do that. And he had incredible success. And ultimately, as you know, he had to, uh, you know, he, the doctors that he worked with had to recant or go to jail. And Rife ended up in jail, came out a broken man. And I will also suggest to you, I think there are a lot of people who have tried to continue his work, but there are two reasons why that hasn't happened. Number one, for the most part, the FDA seized and destroyed most of his microscopes. And without the microscope, you can't observe this stuff. And B, here's the big do. Even if they were to use the same frequencies that he used in the 1900s. Remember my talking about fluidity and change? 
everything evolves, and certainly microbes and one-celled uh, bacteria and vi viruses shift their frequencies all the time. My understanding of his work, though, because I've studied it quite extensively, that he actually measured the frequency of the, for example, a cancer cell, and then he tuned his instruments to use destructive interference, just like a singer shatters a crystal. So he was doing unique frequencies based on the cell of the patient. So if a person had a specific type of cancer, he would use a custom adjustment on his system to match that specific cell. And it would literally wipe the cancer out almost in in instantaneously, but it wouldn't harm the healthy cells. Right. I had not heard that. I had simply heard that he had basically done the method of uh, doing it rather than trying to determine the frequency. Because the determination of the frequency of the uh, healthy cell is a little different. But regardless, you know, le let us hope that it reemerges. There's a fellow by the name of Anthony Hollins at Skidmore who basically was able to do some experiments recently blowing up uh, cancer cells with ultrasonic frequencies. So it's, it's back there, and they're doing some incredible stuff with ultrasonics also, and Parkinson's, using it as a, basically, they put somebody in an MRI, they focal, focalize the blockage, they use the uh, ultrasonic frequency as a non-evasive. In other words, they don't have to color, cut a hole in the skull and the brain, and they're able to sort of blow it up. So g great use of the, quote, destructive use of sound. It's interesting, too, because we're, you know, we, one of the key things you've talked about here is the power of intention. Probably around the year 2000, I went through training and got certified in medical Qigong in the oh, system beautiful. called Qi Lel Qigong. Mm -hmm. And the instructor gave us the URL or the access to a video, which I've, it, I, it's probably on the internet somewhere. I wouldn't. The one in China? Know. It's a Chinese video. And the three, Ch Ch three Qigong practitioners yep. are in a hospital and they're actually monitoring kidney stones real time on a sonogram. And, the, and as the chi, three Tai Chi practitioners are projecting their chi into the kidney of this individual, you literally watch the kidney stones dissolve and turn into a cloud of dust and disappear right on the film. This is a different one. This is one where they're working on a uh, cancer cell. I don't know if you've seen uh, that. They're not a no. cancer cell, a tumor. And the tumor literally disappears. Kien Sabi, I don't know, maybe it's the same one with a different story, but it's fascinating and seems to indicate that there's more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than uh, we're aware of. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing, too, is the lady that taught me medical Qigong, Regina Gill, she's probably 78 years old at the time, didn't look a day over about 50. She was mm -hmm. incredibly beautiful and fit, just a stunning human being. I'm like, wow, if that's what Tai Chi will do for you. I did Tai Chi daily for 18 years, and I studied with another master named Master Fong Ha, who was incredible and blew my all my voyances right out the roof through my Tai Chi practice. Did you ever come across Montak Chia? Of course, yeah. I've got all his books and studied his work too. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of great stuff. But the point I was driving at is she told me that, that when she was in China, there was Qigong practitioners working at hospitals doing these kinds of things all the time because the medical system got to an end where they couldn't help people. And the, tai, the Qigong practitioners could pretty much heal almost anything if the patient was ready to heal. And I, so I think with sound and our intention and the you know, right use of our mind and putting ourselves in the space of giving not fixing to fix, but, you know, thy will be done, letting great spirit move through us. I think a tremendous amount has happened. I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I'm, I'll be 62 next month. And I haven't missed a day of work due to illness in over 40 years because I practice Tai Chi and I chant and I have prayer practices and spiritual practices and a, a variety of practices that I use kind of as part of my just more normal operating system. And I work around the sickest people you can imagine for my whole career. And I just never believed I would get sick. And one day, funny thing happened. One of the therapists in the clinic after several years, there was like 22 physical therapists working where I worked for four years. And they'd all would get sick and this would happen, you know, in and out. And one day somebody noticed, Paul, I've been working with you for years and you haven't missed a day of work due to sickness. He's, they said, how in the world is that, that you don't get sick? And we get sick all the time working with all these people coughing all over us and having all their health issues. 
And I smiled and said, I don't need to get sick to take a rest because I love doing what I do. <laughs> Paul, this brings us to a whole nother topic that I'm just going to skirt with you for a moment. Let's do it. Pastor versus Anton Beauchamp. I don't yep. know if you're even familiar with that, but the idea of ter terrain therapy, I of course. whether or not it's true, because I've been in touch with a Harvard psychiatrist that I recently befriended who's written a book on energy medicine and trying to track down if this is true or just become one of those people's myths. But Beauchamp was a, a contemporary of uh, Pasteur, and his belief was that the it wasn't per se the little critters the bacteria that really caused the illness, but that the, if you like, the field, well, I really yes. like it. I, now we can say the field. They called it the terrain. The field would become weakened. And when the field became weakened, the invader would come in and then establish itself as dis-ease. So this is where my mentor, one of my mentors, Dr. Peter Gaimanos from England, would talk about the fact that if you use a specific set of frequencies through his instrumentation of the SIMA instrument, which would reinforce the organs of the person. And therefore, when that, when that happened, the, uh, if you like, intruders would vanish. Um, so that's one approach that I like. And I talking about sound as an overall gestalt and the destructive use, which we talked about in terms of rife or whatnot, I've had a vision, it was really powerful, it was a dream, if you like, uh, where both these would be utilized with a patient, where you would have the frequency of the healthy organ being created, and at the same time, the frequency, it, it, it was uh, the frequency I see of the intruder, the virus, being used to destroy that, and they would both be used simultaneously. And I think, actually, nobody ever speaks about this, but I think this will be the ultimate future of medicine. It was a complementary use of constructive and destructive frequencies. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. I've got books in my library from all the way back as early as 1938 showing that you can communicate with and affect the DNA of our cell through frequency and also using techniques like radionics and all sorts of stuff. My only point is monks and, and mystics and, and, you know, you look at people like um, St. Hildegard of Bingen and how evolved she was and her, her writings and even her books on diet. If her books on diet were read by people today, they would, it would blow their minds. I mean, she's talking about exactly which meats would be helpful, which illnesses and diseases and things you hardly ever hear anybody talking about. Point being is I think we, we have a reason right now to learn how to take care of ourselves and be healthy and have mental clarity so we can really participate in the future of humanity. Because if we just keep laying around and playing dead, this, the future is not looking too good. All right. I want to go into one of the most self-empowering sounds that we can make. The sound of the hum. Okay, mm. Mm, indeed. And as you know, I've been in this field for well over 40 years, you know, and if, if the field of sound, you know, I've been playing, you know, playing music for over 70. So that's a whole another story. But regardless, uh, you know, I'm versed in harmonics, I'm versed in sacred ratios, I'm versed in bowls, bells, mantras, X, Y, or Z. And I would teach all, I would of teach all this <laughs> stuff to people, and it was great. But sometimes I would return to a place. I'd say, okay, how many of you are doing this as a daily practice? And in a room of 100 people, maybe one or two would raise their hand. And my wife was uh, teaching with me at the time. I said, geez, you know, I, I, under, I got what was going on. I said, we need to find a sound that, number one, people are not judgmental about. And uh, something that's very simple, because, you know, particularly, look, it's always been where people have found uh, that speaking in public, it, it was actually more terrifying than the thought of death. But now that we have shows like American Idol and whatnot, everybody really judges the, vo and the voice. People judge the voice. Who's the best singer? So they're really judgmental. So how can they use? And look, the voice is the most healing instrument. It really is. Uh, it doesn't require electricity, no batteries needed. The owner's manual is relatively easy to use, and it's inexpensive. 
So how can we get people to use the voice? And you can do incredible things in terms of resonating the chakras and changing your etheric field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But most people won't because they got, they're too uptight about even making an, you know, an ah or an e or whatnot. So my wife and I said, what, what's the sound that everybody can make? And we looked at each other and we went, hmm, the hum. So mm, we wrote the world's yeah. first professionally published book on the hum. And it was great because the deeper we got, the deeper down that rabbit hole we got, the more crazy it was to the degree that finding out, for example, that the original uh, sound in the uh, Yoga Sutras was pra prana, but the humming of prana. Uh, but we said, okay, who's going to take a book on humming seriously? We can't. Oh, my God. We have to make the first chapter nothing more or less than peer review information talking about the power of the physiological benefits of the hum. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors. That's awesome. And superfood bars also now come in lemon meringue and red velvet flavors, too, both of which are a big hit with my kids. All you have to do to get your superfood bars and save 15% is go to paleovalley.com forward slash Paul check. That's C-H-E-K. No promo code is needed as your discount will be automatically applied. That's Paleo Valley forward slash Paul check. I hope you love them as much as my family does. Paul, it would be my great honor just to tell you some simple things that are totally in our book, The Humming Effect. This is the first chapter, but I'll just cite some of these. You get increased oxygen in the cells, increased lymphatic circulation. You get lowered blood pressure and heart rate. Now, I got to tell you, this unto itself is huge in terms of, uh, I do a whole lot myself because I, I've suffered from what is called white coat syndrome. So they take uh, my blood pressure and it's very high until I start mm, humming with, of course, deep breath, which we're going to talk about in a second. But it, it can move your... Uh, heart rate and, and um, blood pressure down decade points, dozens of points. It's quite amazing. Next thing, increased levels of melatonin. And we don't need to talk about that. Reduced levels of uh, stress hormones like cortisol. Get the release of endorphins, those fabulous natural painkillers. But here's the really big one. You get increased levels of nitric oxide. Now, as you know, nitric oxide is a vasodilator which means it basically relaxes your circulatory system and allows blood, oxygen, all this stuff to flow more readily. But also, and here's the drum roll big point, nitric oxide. It's antiviral. Nitric oxide is an antiviral agent. And if you hum, you get 15 times the amount of nitric oxide that is normally produced. In fact, you get pharmaceutical uh, levels of uh, nitric oxide where they have these nitric oxide breathers that are used for different shells. I just call them little critters so as not to get myself in trouble, but we can read between the lines. And, you know, whether it's simply treating sinusitis, when people have not been able to successfully treat sinusitis by humming or treating other little things, it's quite a wonderful and powerful, powerful, healthful tool. Let's say yeah. again together, nitric oxide can be generated through humming, and this is amazingly important. And you get the release of uh, oxytocin, which is the trust hormone, which is brilliant. We'll talk about this maybe later. And finally, you get increased heart rate variability. So the fabulous vagus nerve that a lot of people uh, have been really focusing their attention on, there are two ways of consciously, consciously changing the vagal tone. One is through deep breathing. And the other through humming. 
And we have de developed something called conscious humming, which we focus on in the book. And I'm going to go right now for just a moment into that, because one of the predominant and important things about conscious humming, Paul, is you got to take deep breaths. And that unto itself, of course, does it. So, so we're going to do have a little experience of conscious humming, and I want everybody who's listening to try this. But I'm going to give you what we call the protocols. And the first one is just check yourself out before you begin to do humming, just because sometimes you can be levitating, and if you didn't notice uh, that, then you won't notice it. So <laughs> check yourself out. Number one, do a relaxed and deep breath, always. Then have your lips closed. I got to say, this is so important because if I go, mm, and I begin to open my mouth, I go, mm, uh, then the sound energy is coming out. Leaving, and here's, yeah. here's the thing. The most powerful vibroacoustic sound we make, Paul, is the hum. Now, we're going to play a game for a moment, okay? I want you to close your lips and I want you to pinch your nose. Would you do that with me? First, for, and hum. First, we begin to hum and then pinch your nose. Now, now. Mm, did you know this? It's hard. It's hard to hum when you it's got your nose Actually, it's impossible pinched. if you properly. Yeah, it just like chokes totally, it off. Because if you're properly humming, your lips are closed. Sound's got nowhere else to go except maybe your ears. I don't think so, though. So, and then I always say to people, okay, if you didn't know that you can't hum if your nose is uh, closed, do you think maybe there's other things about the magic of the hum that, you know, might occur? Another thing about what we call conscious humming is to hum on one note, okay? Don't want to do the 18-12 overture or zippity doo -dah. That's all great. And, you know, when we're happily humming and, you know, uh, it's all wonderful. But if you want just the vibrational essence, like, for example, nitric oxide being generated, you want to basically hit one frequency that's really going to generate uh, the cells as opposed to moving it around. And most of the time, that one hum is going to be in the range of what we call your, vo your vocal range and a comfortable sound. So while I could do a Tibetan deep hum or a real high falsetto hum, be very hard, it would strain my voice. Louder is not better, more is not better. Hum in a comfortable range. A lot of people really looking for their signature sound, their signature note. And I'd like to suggest most frequently, unless you have some sort of auditory problem that we talked about with Tomatas and the fact you're going to be then toning in a uh, toning and making sound and speaking in a comfortable range. So keep it in your comfort zone. Do it a minimum of three to five times. And that particularly when you're doing nitric oxide uh, humming, you want to do it about three to five times, because after that, uh, the nitric oxide needs a time to regenerate itself. So you have to wait a couple of minutes. And finally, so then the last one is be in silence. So I'll repeat those again. Check yourself out. Deep and relaxed breath. Lips closed. Hum on one note. Hum on a comfortable pitch. Hum a minimum of three to five times and be in silence for an equal amount of time. So shall we try this now, my friend? Yeah, I'm up for it. I hope my humming doesn't cancel out with your humming. No, we'll I don't see. think it will. And I think we'll do it just four times. Uh, and normally I do this a whole lot more, but just also we want to be in silence, but not too long because particularly in a podcast, silence is not golden. That's the one thing. You want to have a little bit of sound. So I may come in after a few seconds and just say, and now be in silence for another minute. Okay? So we'll take a nice deep breath and we'll do four hums. Mmm. Mmm.
and one more. And Paul, I acknowledge that I personally am pretty blissed out right now. You're not alone. Let's take another couple of seconds to really just check yourself out. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So it's real. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It was only four hums, and I felt like I'd been steam cleaned from the inside <laughs> out and revitalized. Like, you know, like people should try that before they drink coffee, you know? Well, I want to suggest that because of all these different physiological benefits that we talked about, let alone the fact that humming is actually a very profoundly powerful Shabd yoga technique. And you were talking about Hazrat Inayat Khan, and there are, uh, who is basically a master of that, because that's a master of inner listening or whatnot, is the fact that there's a powerful, it's called Brahmari Pranayama, or Brahmari Pranayama, which means humming bee breath. But simply what they do is they usually block their ears and hum, but it doesn't matter. It's doing conscious humming like that. And it can really, the effects of it are just phenomenal. And if you do it for five minutes, make sure you're living, allowing yourself five minutes to be in silence, because if you try to get up, you might fall right down again. It can be that powerful, but that great. And you can reach different levels of consciousness. You can communicate with the, you know, with divine aspects of being. You can also, next step is to then add really focused intentionality on the hum. Where do you want the hum to resonate in your body, mind? You know, you want to do it to resonate your chakras. You want to do it to X, Y, or Z with your intention. And you put it on the breath as you're making the hum and voila. Yeah, I love it. There's a couple of things. Thank you for that. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I've done exercises like that in the past, but you know, you get busy and I'm such an explorer that sometimes I forget, oh man, I've got some of these simple techniques. I got to get it back to them. So you've inspired me to get my kids together tonight and hum, practice humming together. Kids love humming. It's a great yeah. way to resonate together, man. Yeah, I'm going to do that with them. I think, and I, I know Angie and Penny will enjoy it too. Just a couple of notes I wanted to hit on before I go to one of the questions I've been itching to ask you about, because it's a deep one and I, it's one of my favorite discussions. A little side note, did you know that Royal Raymond Rife also at one time had the Bonneville, Bonneville Salt Flats speed record for the whole world? Seriously? No, I did not, sir. If you do some research, you can find it. Royal Raymond Rife built his own car. I believe it was a V12 or a V16, and this is in 1920-something, and his salt, his speed record was like crazy fast, like 320 miles an hour, like a bullet car that he built, and he built this entire thing by himself. Beautiful. Paul, I got to ask. What's that? <laughs> gotta, was that nitrous? Oh, no, that's a, a combination of uh, some organic herbs, some clean tobacco, I got a diviner's eye flower essence in there because I'm. it enhances my clairvoyance. So when someone like you is talking or humming or chanting, I like to see what images come up. In fact, I was going to tell you while you were doing the, while we were doing the humming, I had an image like a sun in eclipse with light shooting out from behind the black, it looked like a black hole with a sun in, in eclipse behind it shooting light out, which was really cool. I've never had that vision come inside of me before. And I was watching the sound system here and listening. If I match my frequency to yours, it would cut out. So I went slightly above yours and that's when the vision started to appear. How beautiful. Well, good ears on you too, for being able to do that. Yeah, I was lit because I can hear it through the mic and I can see the, you know, it'll, it'll put a box around when you're talking to let you know it's, it's picking you up. And it was canceling each other out. It was going like that. So I'm like, okay, it's probably going to make it funny sounding for the listener. So I slightly shifted my tone just above yours a little bit, which is easier because I have a higher voice. And all of a sudden I was having these visions that look very much like depictions of a black hole, but it was though there was a sun behind it 
with light shooting out. And I'm like, wow, that's a cool visual. I might have to paint that. Cool. You know what? Of course, you were doing when you were slightly changing the uh, pitch. Yeah. Is you were creating what is called difference tones. Or, yeah. I mean, John uh, Reed thinks he made a discovery of something called heterodyning. I don't think so. It's been known about for a long time, which is that simply two slightly out of pitch uh, sounds will create either a beat frequency or a binaural frequency or whatnot. And you're doing that, which is therefore an extremely low frequency as well. Hey, Paul, I'm having a great time. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much. It's just such a joy to be able to talk to you in person. I've been watching you and reading you and listening to you for a long time. So to have you here is kind of a special experience for me. Great. Um, I went upstairs. My wife uh, you know, says, you know, are you done? I said, no, I'm still doing it. She goes, what? I said, I'm having a good time. She said, okay. <laughs> But the wives are always the managers, you know. Yes, indeed. Thank God. <laughs> well, there's so many places that we could go. And one of the things that I consciously have not dealt with, and we're not going to do it now, uh, just because I don't think my purpose can be, uh, I mean, I, I think I've already been on a, uh, shall we say, a political hit list for quite a while. So I try to be under the radar with a lot of stuff. We um, are obviously at a, a evolutionally stage in our development where we can somehow coalesce to create a combined consciousness that may offer a solution to some of the endemic problems that are facing us right now. Yeah, I think if we all start humming together, we'll, we'll do well. I really am serious. I mean, it's so easy. Anyone can do it. I recently had a Zoom with a uh, fellow who's become a friend, and he used to be Princess Diana's vocal coach and oh, uh, therapist. And he said, Jonathan, did you ever think of uh, having a time when you get all these people together live, making a conscious ohm for planetary peace and healing? And I said to this fellow, well, that's brilliant. And just uh, a week ago, I got the uh, uh, URL, the do domain name, Big Ohm. So maybe awesome. we can do this. But Absolutely. You know, we do do uh, once a year, and we've done it for twenty the past 21 years, is this phenomenon called World Sound Healing Day, which is basically, the idea simply is for, you know, intentionalized sound, conscious sound, I think is the most powerful tool on the planet. Sound as an energy medicine is also the grossest, the slowest moving, and therefore the most powerful on the physical plane. You encode that with intentionality, and you have an unbeatable phenomena. And here's just a thought, and I know that you know this. There's been a lot of work with the heart and the brain, the brain and the heart being in a state of coherence. Yeah, heart when mass. Right. When this occurs, our electromagnetic field is anywhere from 50 to 500 to some even speculate 5,000 times greater. And I'm going to tell you, there is a way of enhancing this even more. What is that? Through sound, particularly through either the hum or an ohm or whatnot. There is a reason why the different prayers on our planet are vocalized, whispered, chanted, spoken, or sung. is because sound amplifies and coalesces and focuses the power of our prayers and our meditations and makes it so much more. Yes. I've been meaning to start singing my prayers in the morning, so thank you for reminding me to, to do that. I have a prayer routine that I go through every morning. And I was studying something recently on sound and it talked about the importance and the history of singing prayers. And I thought, I'm going to start singing my prayers because I want to put more energy behind the intention and let it work on my body as well. So I really appreciate you reminding me to do that. And for anybody who's listening, who is Problem singing, you can hum your prayers, that type of thing. But just to do it as a, I mean, that, you know, love it. You are an advanced being. For those who have trouble uh, singing, humming or even, just, you know, it is a great thing. But the idea or doing an ah uh, sound, it can almost be riding on your breath, but doing some sort of vocalized sound and then encoding intention, encoding gratitude an appreciation. Oh, it's so important. This is one of the things. So in World Sound Healing Day, we began 
by uh, literally having the ah sound, which a lot of people feel is the sound of love and the sound of the heart center. Ah. And we would have them just do that intentionalize sending a sonic valentine to the Gaia Matrix, our Mother Earth, because World Sound Healing Day, for better or for worse, is taking place on Valentine's Day. Oh, cool. And uh, we uh, have now shifted it to include different types of musics. You know, you can play drums, you can uh, play bowls, bells, guitar, chamber, orchestra, jazz, or as long as you do it with the intentionality of kindness, love, compassion, then it's a good sound. If you do it projecting it as a Valentine, the Earth Mother, what a great thing. And I just, um, I think it would be, you know, even better for us to, on a level, return back to the tone of the human voice and just doing an ah sound. And I encourage people to go visit us at worldsoundhealingday.org to see what's been happening. And we'll be, uh, you know, resurrecting it again before, before, February 14th, but I think it's so important. And as you know, there's something called the Global Consciousness Project that initially was, uh, and I'll stop for a second and just do a little backtrack. It was initially uh, done through Princeton University, and here's what happened. They were first trying to see if consciousness could somehow affect reality. So they began to work with these things called random number generators. Random number generator is nothing more or less than somebody flipping a coin, except it's done through a computer. So you would get 50% of the time, you'd get a zero, and 50% of the time, you'd get a one. And um, what they found was that events of high compassion created numbers that were not even. To such a degree that they could then chart that and find out. And for example, on one of the World Sun Healing Days, the guy who founded this, and actually a few of them, but you would normally, because it's a, uh, it's 50% zeros, 50% uh, ones, you get a straight line. But if it's off, you get something that looks like a mountain peak. And it was, you know, World Sun Healing Day and many other events display this phenomena, which is really important because it means something is going on. Yes, it means we are affecting consciousness. There you go. We are contributing to it. And when we harmonize, we have an effect on the whole world. I think that's really what's important, which is why in many of my podcasts, dealing with all the issues going on in the world in the last three years, especially, I say, look, you know, we really need to focus on the fact that these are all things that are dividing us, but there's one thing we've got to look at And that is that we all live our life on this planet. And this planet needs our support. We need to clean the soils up. We need to clean the water up. We need to clean the air up. Without that common foundation, none of us can live our dreams. And if we stop paying attention to and getting caught up in race differences, sex differences, you know, medical application differences, and really start recognizing that the one thing we all need together is to take care of the planet, then we all have a common dream together and we can organize ourselves around a common dream. And if we work together for one common dream that supports all of us, no matter what your opinion is, there's no way around the fact that we all need the earth. We'll start learning how to work together, how to create together, how to live together and how to love together. And I think that's what we really need is we need to get past differences to something that we all have equal footing on. And we all have equal footing on the earth. We can't live without it. Well, hallelujah on that. For some reason, I was traveling back to a really particularly powerful interdimensional experience I had in the 80s in, I guess, Cozumel or someplace like that. But I had this vision of something called the Green Cross, Mm. which would be used uh, rather than the Red Cross being used to help people. Green Cross would be uh, founded to uh, be environmentally, uh, but Green Cross apparently is uh, some sort of uh, right now marijuana <laughs> platform. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. But yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I do totally, totally concur and agree with you. And it's interesting because there's also, believe it or not, a relationship between sound and plants. Yes, and there the is. And energy I, fields. I've studied Cleve Baxter's work extensively, and I actually had the benefit of actually taking a workshop with him. He taught a workshop in my building 
and I'm like, oh my God. And I literally had to just walk upstairs and I was in the class with him and he was such a beautiful man. And I've looked at all of his research in The Secret Life of Plants. I mean, that was a mind blowing book that anyone reading it today would still have their mind blown. And, you know, plants are amazing. And I think people, I tell people all the time, if you want to learn how to reconnect to life and learn how to love and have the responsibility of love, simply buy a plant and take care of it and develop a relationship with it. It's a safe way to learn to love. And you have to engage in the responsibility of love because if you forget to water it, it dies. And you realize you've negated your love responsibility. And that tells you a lot about how you're probably loving yourself and others. Cleve Baxter, yes, I had a similar opportunity as you. What a blessing. Most people don't know about him, although they've taken some of his technology and taken it to a different level that I don't know how scientific it is, but since the plants put out, or maybe we should just coalesce uh, what his work was. Basic bottom line is he began by putting uh, polygraphs on uh, lie detector uh, things on plants, found out that they put out an electromagnetic current, and this could be charted. And for example, if they were in fear or damage or whatnot, or saw some sort of uh, life form being threatened, they would, they would sort of go off the scale. So there, there is a reality there. But what, what has happened is now they've co- created a music of the plant type of uh, instrument that I have I, I, I think I've heard it. I don't know how real it is because there's a phenomena called MIDI. And MIDI mm-hmm. is Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Yes. That means that you program something, with, and, you know, an electromagnetic current goes through there and it turns it into sound. But it all depends on how they're programming it. Yeah. Because I just think that the personally, and they've done the same thing with uh, Sounds of Planets. And I just, I don't know how real it is. Because when stuff starts sounding like a symphonic orchestra, I think that's human having, humans having an interplay in terms of the programming of what the uh, uh, the frequencies and the ele- electromagnetism is going to sound like to be right. pleasing to humans. Yes. Interestingly, though, having heard several of those devices actually working, the music they create is always that Different. I've heard is quite uh, relaxing. It's kind of totally. kind of it's, yeah. quite, it's like I would play that on a shamanic journey or something because it would really calm people. No, I, I think it's fabulous. I'm just always uh, sometimes the the scientist in me goes, "Well, is that for real?" Not yeah, that I the free that if you like the waveform isn't. But in other words, you know, turning it into uh, other things. But it's interesting. It doesn't matter. And I think it's wondrous. And what's really cool is just as I toned this crystal over here and came up with harmonics, I remember a time in my uh, youth when I was walking around the streets of uh, Boston and I would be toning or making harmonic sounds to uh, uh, trees that were in the street and perhaps in ill health, knowing that my sound, could help restore and regenerate the uh, vibrational essence of, you know, the tree. And this is something we forget too. Uh, it's interesting. My wife and I walk every day for an hour. And I, uh, we're just blessed to have a, a, uh, an outdoor wildlife uh, sanctuary. And uh, we do it to rejuvenate ourselves. And I think this is so mandatory for humans to basically stay in resonance with the earth we get so jaded by all the various frequencies that are being beamed at us all the time. And as you were saying, even having plants around is great and trying to get around nature. Apparently in Japan, now they have something called a nature bath where people go out in nature and it's, you know, they perceive it and that's what they need. But what you're saying was just so brilliant and so beautiful. We, we must remember this, you know, that, uh, and, you know, Paul, bottom line is I am sure that if we can work together with our consciousness and our, just drop our egos and really come with a place of compassion of how can we somehow regenerate this, we can come up with an answer. We're pretty bright. One plus one equals three. Yeah, it does. That's why Jesus said, whenever two or more get together in my name, I will be there. Because every there time... Go. Two of us gets together, we create what in union psychology is called the third. Like right now, there's a third created out of my consciousness and yours inter- inter- overlapping and creating the third that is the best of both of us to give to the world. And 
The more of us that do that, the more we just envelop the whole planet with higher consciousness and people shift without even working at it. And we were talking before exactly about the same thing. And I, I called it sonically or acoustically a difference tone. But when you make a sound and I make a sound, the sounds combine and the difference between the frequencies are going to add up and the con as a combination uh, are going to divide the difference between the two is going to create a very low sound and the summation tone, the additive tone is going to come through. So you actually get four different sounds when two people do it. And that's a phenomena of the physics of sound. And then you add the phenomena of harmonics within the sounds. And it is extraordinary the multitudinous number of various frequencies that occur, which is why it's really important for us not to get so jaded as to go, this is the tone for this. I've seen a lot of that. And if people need that as a belief system, I honor it. But someday we're going to kick off the training wheels and just go, I can use any sound, project my consciousness and create bliss. Yes, indeed. Hi everybody, my family and I love Organifi's green juices. You can get your green juice in two excellent flavors, crisp apple and original mint. Not only are these products made with certified organic ingredients to support your family's nutritional needs, they each have some unique benefits. Your green juice crisp apple eases stress with an effective dose of 600 milligrams of ashwagandha per serving, helps reduce cortisol spikes that increase snacking urges and aids keeping your blood sugar balanced. Why snack on inferior foods that lack nutrition and often lead to blood sugar spikes followed by blood sugar crashes when Organifi's green juices are super healthy? taste great, and are as quick to make as opening the package and adding water. Your green juice crisp apple is made from fresh apples picked right off the branch and are packed with micronutrients to support your body's needs. Green juice original mint contains ashwagandha, chlorella, and spirulina. Reset your body every morning with 11 detoxifying superfoods. You'll love the delicious taste and your body will feel strong and stable with all the micronutrients in each serving. Green Juice Original Mint promotes balanced cortisol and stress levels, perfect for weight management, and helps rid the body of harmful toxins. Personally, I'm super grateful that Organifi makes such excellent, easy-to-use drinks and foods that keep us energized, healthy, and clean inside while decreasing the urge to crave on inferior snack foods. My kids love both flavors, and I love knowing that we can all be healthy together with Organifi's excellent crisp apple and original mint green juices. These products are excellent for work, on the road, sharing with friends, and anytime you need a nutritious boost that tastes good. To get your crisp apple and original mint green juices, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash check 20. That's Organifi dot com forward slash check 20. Save 20% on your purchase using the code CHECK20, all caps, on checkout. Don't worry if you forget your Living 4D discount code because you'll see it right there on the landing page. Enjoy Organifi's excellent green juices. We haven't, neither of us have mentioned this yet. I believe I read this in Eileen Day McCusick's book, Tuning the Human Biofield. Uh, that's where my memory is taking me, but I've studied so much, it's hard to remember some key references. But I have seen scientific studies on Tibetan monks where they took samples of their cerebral spinal fluid before and after a, a chanting and toning session, and they showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that it purified and cleaned their cerebral spinal fluid, which is pretty phenomenal. I have no doubt about that one. Yeah. 
And then the other thing is in my study of various meditation types, I, I found one called the Mu meditation. And the explanation given by the Buddhist monk that they were interviewing said that they use the word Mu, which I later found out actually has a meaning in Tibetan, which surprised me. But he said that we use this Mu meditation because Mu has no meaning. So the brain cannot assign any meaning to it. Therefore, the intellectual mind does not attach to it. And so it's a very simple meditation where the leader would just say, moo, and you would respond. If he goes, moo, moo, you respond. So whatever he does, you do. And by playing, and I've done this with my students many times, it's quite powerful. So by feeling the group and sensing how wound up they are, that will determine how many moos I use or the pace or the frequency of them. And then we go into silence. And as they get more calm, the gap of silence gets longer. But because mu doesn't mean anything, their brain stops attaching meaning to it. Therefore, the intellectual mind relaxes. And all of a sudden, you're in these deep, blissful states of uh, emptiness and silence. And you just have this tremendous calming effect. So that was one I wanted to bring up. Yeah, just three, three things came into mind. Uh, one of them was a bad joke, so I'm not going to do that. Oh, shit, uh, I want to hear it. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but bottom line is I was thinking about the fact that meaningless syllables relate all the way back to Herbert Benson and the relaxation response. He was a uh, Harvard uh, doctor, uh, basically, who found that the repetition of a single syllable would create uh, calmness and heart brain, et cetera. And this is back in the 1970s, probably, maybe the 80s. But cool. regardless, and then you think of TM, which is supposedly, and I'm saying supposedly because I don't know if we want to necessarily go there, but supposedly the original uh, mantras of TM were meaningless. And that was the purpose. That's why they worked is that people couldn't do it. But then let me ask you a question. If I say OM to you, what does OM mean? Well, see, to me, because I have too much study, then I immediately think of all the studies on OM and I awaken, I'm dreaming, I'm falling asleep, empty, and underscore creation cycles. Wow. So for me, when you say OM, it means the primordial sound. To me, OM is the sound of God singing itself into existence. I love it. What about the hum? What does the hum mean? The hum for me is not a meaning, it's a feeling. It's it, it means I'm engaging myself and taking responsibility for myself. It's interesting. In Tibetan Buddhist theory, one of the most powerful uh, chants is the Om Ah Hu chant, Om Ah Hum. And it goes, the Om is the crown, the Ah is the throat, and the Hum is the heart chakra. And um, in fact, in the uh, oftentimes in the Tibetan tradition, it begin the, a mantra will begin with the Om and end with the Hom, which is sort of the counterpoint or book and balance of it. And I mean, it's interesting. I think we can properly, you know, when you're saying uh, Mu has no meaning, I just couldn't help seeing cows. <laughs> I know it's kind of funny because you know we all associate Mu with a cow. Uh, you know, I've tried tried other mis making stuff up too, and you know, it's fun because when your brain can't attach a meaning to it, it does make it easier. I find to go into a state of emptiness, you know, which for a lot of people is important. <laughs> Long time ago, just as an experiment, I wanted to see what would happen if I reversed an ohm. Oh, how'd that go? And I thought maybe it, it was an ohm backwards as ohm. It is not mu. Just wanted you to know that. I was really severely disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you tried. <laughs> you know, I did a lot of work with backwards sound and uh, the whole idea of backwards masking. Do you know anything about this? I'll spend two minutes on it. It's crazy because it's one of those things that my mind cannot wrap around it. But it was about a backwards speech. And this fellow wrote this book and did this whole thing where he took famous word uh, speeches and then played it backwards and uh, without even getting into Stairway to Heaven, which is a whole nother story. But uh, you can clearly hear Neil Armstrong when he's saying one small step for man, one uh, whatever. Is you, you can hear him saying, I'm walking on the moon. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It, it's crazy. That is crazy. I can't. I can't wrap my head around it because I have enough difficulty making a coherent statement that goes forward. Yeah. To think that I'm having stuff happening subliminally backwards 
is just too much. And uh, it's, you know, <laughs> not in this dimension. Can I handle it? Well, you must know the joke. What happens when you play country music backwards? No. You get your dog back, your car back, and your girl back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, super. In most religions, God is source. By definition, God is that for which there is no other. In the conception of Tantra, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, God would be non-dual. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how a non-dual source creates frequencies that necessitate a duality to create. For example, some Taoists refer to the unstruck sound of the Tao. Alan Watts speaks of the two hands of God. So how is it in your conception that we get from the non-dual one hand of God to the addition of the second hand that's essential for creating sound? Okay. In the Hindu tradition, there's a phenomenon known as Advaita. Yes, I'm familiar. I've studied which it. Which is non-duality. I like to perceive... And all of my personal experience is that sound is non-dualistic in nature. Uh, in other words, you can't separate the sound. You can't separate. It is all one. It is a gestalt that is sacred, that is divine. And this is why in, for example, the Shabd Yoga tradition or, or in many of the different yoga traditions, they utilize sound, whether it's mantra or tone, or whatnot, as a tool to um, really travel to the divine. It's one of my key things. I'm going to actually jump away at a totally different thing. I have to share this with you. Some people these days suffer, a lot of people suffer from something called tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ear. Mm -hmm. There is some thought that tinnitus is actually an aspect of the divine sound current. Mm. And even before I read this, when people would come up and go, what can I do about this tinnitus is driving me crazy? I said, make it your ally and not your adversary. So I want to just suggest that even if you have tinnitus, folks, anybody who, who has it there, you can sit there and close your eyes and literally meditate on the sound and travel on the sound to it as being an aspect of the source of all that is. If we're talking about non-duality, the ocean on a level is non-dualistic, but it is composed of a gazillion different drops that become one. Perhaps sound is an aspect of the ocean, of the word, of the essence of being, of all that is. Mm. Yes. When I asked my soul how that could possibly happen, my soul said, the act of God looking into itself produces the second hand that makes the sound. The creative sound of Om is the act of God looking into itself to engage relationships so that it can love and experience itself. So the first hand of God is big C, God consciousness. The second hand is God looking into itself and dreaming itself into existence. And in that process, the sound of Om is what creates the holographic universe in which we all have our existence and is God dreaming itself into existence so that it could experience love. Paul, I want to salute you with that. As I was listening to that, I thought, wow, I cannot solve the great mystery. I do not attempt to solve the great mystery. You're attempting to do that as many mystics have done. And I want to honor you. I, I just go, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, if God is that for which there is no other, then God has nothing to look at but itself. So the, the act of a non-duality looking into itself creates a duality. There's a subject looking into its own object, just like when we dream. Yeah. Totally. So God, God dreaming, and if all frequency is ultimately sound, as the mystics say, and as Inyat Khan says, then it would be the act of God looking into itself to love itself that would produce sound. And there would be the second hand is, is, is the look. Or the dance of Shiva. And, and Shiva and Shakti, yeah. And, and uh, there you go. Shakti 
wanting a consort. And so you go into the Nada Bindu and there you have the birth of, of the explicate order. Sometimes I've had the ability of traveling into what might be considered an aspect of that Advaita source. And I want to say that sounds, certain sounds in particular, can be very, very effective for different people. And once again, because mm-hmm. we're all unique vibratory beings, I mean, you can check out some of my stuff on uh, my Jonathan Goldman official uh, YouTube thing to see if they resonate with you. And they resonate for me. I create my music first for myself. And I found it's an incredible tool for me to be able to stretch out and travel, use my work as consciousness. I think this is one of the great, shall we say, it's time to rediscover sound as being a portal or vehicle of shifting and traveling our consciousness on into the divine. We forget about this. One of my favorite CDs of yours that I use for when I'm doing spiritual investigation work or just want to have something in my space that's healing for me is your chakra healing CD, where you go through all the sounds of the chakras and you have music for each of them. It's, it's powerful. It's, I love it because I can write to it. Uh, my mind stays focused and I feel like it has a healing effect on my body. So I would encourage everybody to look into all of Jonathan's music because there's not a single CD you've ever put out that I haven't really enjoyed. Well, it's interesting. When my wife and I go interdimensional, we oftentimes will, I've created a playlist uh, for her and I've created one for me because it's slightly different. I like, uh, in particular, I have a recording called Holy Harmony. That I has got it. Been, I love it. Yeah. And and once again, the Merkaba sound, I also use too. I like to have one, and this is just an interesting thought. I like to have one basically, you know, vibrational, like morphic field that my psyche can travel into and explore and be for quite a while. I spoke to a friend of mine who's a uh, well-known doctor, and I said, well, if I was doing a uh, an interdimensional traveling for uh, the people you work with, how long would the pieces be? And he said, about five minutes long. I said, wow. what? <laughs> you know, yeah. so... To me, that you know, our constrained ADD level of consciousness is uh, we we need to expand a little bit more, Paul. <laughs> no question. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the thing is that expansion is very important because a big part of the problem we have is is too much I centric conscious orientation, and when we expand to the we. And then to the all, we realize what the self really is and that we can't be here without each other. We all need each other, right? I I need Jonathan's musical skills to enhance my meditation and my writing work. Somebody makes the toilet paper we use. Someone makes the cars we drive. Someone makes the computers we use. You know, when you start really looking around and thinking, wow, you know, you got all this racial stuff and all this other stuff. But nobody ever asked the question, what color was the person that made the keyboard on my computer or the screen? We don't care about that. But we don't realize we all need each other. We all bring a piece to the puzzle. And if we celebrate that we are each part of something bigger than ourselves, whether it be through sound or meditation or a relationship, we, then we can, we can grow our sense of self to include each other instead of all this, you know, focused exclusion that's so popular and and so damaging to all of us. Well, you know, if you think about it, very few people, when they're tapping their foot and listening to a piece of music, will inquire about what color is this person, where are they from, what state are they from, what's their background. They'll just flow into the field that is being created. And I think that's a great metaphor. I was thinking you and I were like co-creating this conversation. It's gone places I could not have possibly uh, thought, and what a blessing it is. So, yeah, honoring the oneness that is created by the many. What a blessing. Yeah, and that's what I think we should all focus on. I would like to just let you say whatever it is important for you to share. I know you have the world meditation uh, sound thing you wanted to talk about. Uh, You have that video on your YouTube channel that I looked at. And, and maybe you can share whatever's on your mind and then uh, give us some places to go to find whatever you'd like to direct people to. Well, first of all, I would th- and thank you, Paul, for this opportunity. And I would like to just suggest that I have a website. I have a number of websites, but I particularly have one website called HealingSounds.com. That sounds with an S at the end of it. And it's got all sorts of information, free downloads. 
Sonic Toys, because humans like toys very much, and all sorts of things. It's an award-winning website. And I want to suggest that people go there because it's a great place to get lost and explore mm. uh, the realms of uh, sound. On a level, I like to believe that I was put on this planet to help empower people and this planet, all the beings on the planet, with the power of sound to heal and transform. It's a real blessing. I have so many different things. I, you know, I don't have personally a particularly favorite music. I don't have a particularly favorite book. And I try to, for the most part, utilize the seven secrets of sound healing with all my music, but not have it just be a repetitive type of music. Some people, and blessed be, they do one type of music and then they've recreated the same album 50 times, which is a blessing. I try to do different stuff because I get bored. Yeah, I'm uh, glad you do because I love the differences. I, Like I said, I dig your music and I dig the creativity in it. And What I love about your music, Jonathan, is this might sound funny, but I feel you in it. And I've watched you on stage. I've I've listened to countless hours of you. And when I'm listening to you, I feel you channeling higher consciousness through you. But I feel your compassion and I feel your empathy and I feel your genuine interest in what's best for all living beings. And I, I just want to say thank you for that because, you know, your intention is in your music and I'm sensitive enough to feel it. And I really encourage anybody, if there's anybody out there that hasn't listened to Jonathan's music, it's it's very healing and very powerful. And I feel your passion and your love in it. And you, you know, you've been doing this a long time. So, you know, a labor of love is sustainable and a labor without love is not sustainable. And, and the fact that you've been doing this so long can only be powered by your love. So I just want to say thank you. Oh, Paul, that's beautiful. And I, I'm just going to share with you a little secret that, uh, Anybody who's a musician and uh, aspiring to do music, as I, as you know, I think intentionality is so important that not only when I'm creating the music and I'm, you know, oftentimes trying to set a sacred field where I'm going to create the uh, music and, you know, invoke different beings and do whatever rituals, etc. But at the very end, I will take the CD or whatever modality that I'm using as a master and I'll put it into the, you know, into literally a crystal grid and invoke all these entities of light and love that want to manifest in the sound and ask them that they basically be present when other people listen to it. So that's one of the things that I try to do, because I think that you were, you were talking about the oneness and all, ultimately the oneness, you know, our, our divisiveness is really all artificial. We are yeah. really all one. It's just, you know, I mean, that there are forces that want to keep us apart so that we don't codify together and become a cre extraordinary cre creational, blissful aspect of being. And I think we can do that. I think we can solve all the problems and we can get ahead. If we can basically, what a blessing it would be if we could work with the energy of compassion, if we could basically work with the energy of cooperation, if we could stop getting into this whole greed power phenomena that has driven our planet for so long if we can take that next step we'll be just fine my friend i agree well i'll say thank you jonathan and uh thank you to all of you listening you look if you just start humming and just do some of the most basic things we've talked about today you're on the right path and you know that's what free will free will is so free will only exists when you choose to make a choice to do something because you have the agency to do it. And if you just live out your habits, then you're just trapped in your programming and you don't have free will. But if you choose to hum, you choose to listen to somebody else and, and see what it is that they're saying from their heart. If you do anything, water your plants, share love in any way, that's what you're putting into the world. I think this is the great opportunity for us all to realize that we all are co-creating together. And, and uh, it's, it's just a little a little bit each day. And, and I'll just close by giving an example. You know, there's a lot of talk by the year 2030, water could be one of the most expensive commodities on the planet because we're running out of water. And it's important to not waste water. 
And so my students will say things like, well, how in the world are we going to deal with that? What can I do with a problem that big? And I say, okay, look, there's about 8 billion people on the planet. Let's pretend they all have a toilet. In California, we have a saying, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down so we don't flush toilets too often. Well, each toilet flush is about three to five gallons of water. So if one toilet flush was saved by each person every day, and there's 8 billion of us, that's 24 billion gallons of water we save by just not flushing the toilet once. So if we just think of with 8 billion people just doing one little thing, sending out a prayer, chanting, humming, putting the intention to make the world a better place for all living beings. Imagine the power of that when we all do it together, even if it's just metaphorically one little toilet flush. You add that up and that's a lot. And I think, I think all we got to do is think about what can I just do as a gift to the world and to creating wholeness a day and one little act. And if we all just did that one little act, you will see the world begin to change right in front of you different way of looking at this, but we heal the planet, we heal ourselves. We heal ourselves and we heal the planet. We can make a difference and we have a choice. Amen. Oh, great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure, man. Thank you to my sponsors for all your great products and for creating sustainable products and using regenerative farming and making the soil even better than it was and for feeding us all food that nourishes us and vitalizes us. Thank you for all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors. I know it's not only making you healthier, but it's putting money in the hands of the people that really care about us and the planet. And thank you all for joining Jonathan and I today and participating in making the world a better place for all living beings, not just human beings, but all living beings. And I look forward to sharing something exciting and interesting with you next week. Lots of love.
Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Jonathan Goldman. You can visit Jonathan's website at healingsounds.com to browse his books, courses, audio downloads, and more. You can also get a free download of his seven-minute chakra tune-up by going to healingsounds.com forward slash sound dash miracles or join his newsletter for updates, the latest sound healing information, and special discount offers. Right now, Jonathan is also re-releasing one of his signature online courses, Sacred Vibrational Frequencies. Go to bit.ly forward slash Jonathan Goldman course for full details and to sign up. That's bit dot ly forward slash Jonathan Goldman course. Catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok and threads at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You could read the show notes and find the links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors by Optimizers, Organifi and Paleo Valley, our podcast sponsors, Ned and Wild Pastures, and our preferred product sponsor, Peak Life. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for listeners. The links are in the show notes as well as the promo codes. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcast, and YouTube.